Welcome to Stu Show. If you'd like to take part in today's live program, send your correspondence to comments at stewshow.com. Previous programs can be searched and downloaded by visiting the website, www.stewshow.com. Just click on the archives link and you'll have access to over nine years of conversations with celebrities, writers, producers, directors, authors, and TV historians. Thanks for listening. Stu Show is now a proud partner with Patreon. Patreon, where creative artists are supported by donors who appreciate their craft. You can get special rewards every month for helping Stu Showstack continue to produce this weekly program. Become a VIP listener and help keep the legacy of classic television alive. Visit StuShow.com and click on the VIP listeners link at the top of the page for more information. Hi, I'm Stuart Pankin. You know me from not necessarily the news, Fatal Attraction, Dinosaurs, plus a whole lot of other television series and movies. And this is Stu Show. So, despite everything you've heard, at least the name of this program is pretty cool. This is the NBC Television Network. Everyone in Dootyville is shouting hooray! Cause we're in living color! Oh, we're in living color! We're, we're in, in living, living color, color today! today. <laughs> Say, kids, what time is it? It's the 2,343rd Howdy Doody Show, starring Howdy Doody and Buffalo Bob Smith. Say, kids, what time is it? It's howdy duty time. It's howdy duty time. Bob Smith and howdy to say howdy do to you. Let's give a rousing cheer. Cause howdy duty's here. It's time to start the show. So kids, let's go! Well, that was wonderful, and there's one little girl here. Sweetie, would you stand up and sing it all alone? Come on, sing it real, real loud for me. Come on. Howdy, Doody! Keep going, honey. Keep singing, sing it. Howdy, Doody! Howdy, Doody! That a girl. Howdy, Doody! Celebrating over 10 years on the internet and live from Chatsworth, California, it's Stu Show. Unrehearsed, uncensored, up close and personal conversations with top celebrities from the world of television, both in front of and behind the cameras. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's your host, Stu Showstack. Hello, how cool was that, huh? A color videotape of the Howdy Doody show. And did you notice that was Cher's first time singing on television? I didn't know she had blonde hair back then, did you? Amazing, amazing. Oh, we're going to have so much fun today. I am so thrilled to be doing this show. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long, long time. Hello, everybody. Welcome. It is Wednesday, June 7th, 2017. We're going to salute what I think is the iconic pioneering television program today, the one that really sold a lot of television sets for NBC and RCA. We'll get to that in a second. Today, by the way, is going to be, it is the first time in our new schedule of doing shows bi-weekly. Did I, did I tell you I'm bi now? I didn't think you knew that. Let me turn this on. Is this working? Ooh. It is working. I'm bi. We're bi-weekly now. We're, we're, on the sh we're on the air every other week now, so I can take a little bit more time off and prepare the television versions of these shows for all of you a little bit more, so there'll be a lot more clips, a lot more visual qualities to the show, and uh, so from this point on, we're every other week, but we every other week, we're televised, and I started to say this is the first of the new schedule. It's also the last time you're going to be watching us via Ustream, because I've been listening to you folks, and I know those commercial interruptions are, are, are a pain in the butt. I know that they're a 
problem. And I know that the, the banner advertising mm. at the bottom of the screen for some of you is a pain in the butt as well. So starting with our show on June 21st, we are moving off of Ustream and moving to Daycast. Two seconds of applause. <laughs> And the Daycast people have been absolutely wonderful in courting me to their wonderful video streaming services. Not only will you be able to continue to watch the show on the website, but they're giving me an embedded player for Facebook. Yes. Ooh. If you're on Facebook, you can watch the show right on the StuShow.com group page on Facebook. They're giving me a Roku channel. They're giving me an Apple TV channel. They're giving me Chromecast. And they're giving me a pay-per-view area for people to watch the show after we do it so as I said some of the shows will continue occasionally <clears throat> occasionally to be on YouTube but for um, archival purposes we're moving over to a pay-per-view area where we'll have a nominal fee to watch the shows after we've done them you will continue to get to see the show live at no cost and if you're a VIP listener if you're a VIP supporter I gotta change that it's no longer VIP listener it's listener slash viewer now if you're one of those you will still get to watch the shows after we do them on demand at no cost so please check out the VIP the Patreon area on the stewshow.com website become a VIP listener slash viewer supporter of the show you get all these perks and you get free classic TV videos to watch too that nobody else gets to see okay I'm done with the plugs we gotta get the show started oh my guest is falling asleep over there we got to get started here okay so here we go we are saluting howdy duty today i am so pleased to have this gentleman back on the show he was here in january we covered a lot of his own career then but i also found out that he is an expert a true historian when it comes to puppetry ventriloquism and howdy duty give me a new Ooh. thank you so much and of course the iconic kids tv series that put nbc on the map when it came to daily television in the 1940s and early 1950s actually the show ran all the way to 1960 but there were a couple of bumps along the way which we will talk about howdy and Milton Berle sold a hell of a lot of television sets for NBC back in the days, which is why it was odd, here we go, I'm going to rant, that the network chose to totally ignore, ignore, Howdy's contribution to television history when they aired their 90th anniversary program last February. I wish I had a boo on this machine instead of an ooh, because I would use it right there. Well, we're going to change all that today, folks, because we're devoting an entire broadcast to Howdy, Buffalo Bob Smith, Clarabelle the Clown, Chief Thunder Thud, Princess Summer, Fall, Winter, Spring. Oh, my, was she hot, huh, folks? Uh, the Flub a Dub, Phineas T. Bluster, and all the rest. And whether you are old enough to fondly remember these characters or whether you're just now about to learn and be entertained by them, you're going to come away from this program today with new respect and the many reasons why this series is so beloved by millions of baby boomers everywhere. That deserves it. <laughs> And here's the guy, here's the guy who's going to tell us everything we want to know about Howdy Doody, the expert himself. Please welcome back to the show the Emmy Award winning talk show producer, my buddy, my pal, Mr. Bert Dubrow. There he is. <laughs> We made it. We made it. We made it. We, we certainly did make it, and I can't thank you enough. When We have not been friends all that long. I, less than a year, I think, or uh, about a year. But it feels like a long time. <laughs> thanks. thanks well, no, no, I mean that I, in the <laughs> nicest possible way. <laughs> okay. I all do. right. But the point is, I had no idea after this massive career that you've had producing these hit after hit after hit talk shows that you're a you're an aficionado of, of not just Howdy Doody, but Paul Winchell and Edgar Bergen and Puppets and Muppets, and, and, but, but but howdy is your first love. Yeah, yeah, w without a doubt. I mean, I was uh, I was lucky enough to be born around that time, and uh, howdy was the first thing I remember that sort of got me into television, interested in television, and loved the live end of it. Well, it had everything. It had live. It had puppets. It had a live host, and. Uh, uh, it, for me, it was perfect. The last time you were on the show, we talked at length. And download that show because the first 20 or 25 minutes, that's all we talked about was, was Bert's love for Howdy Doody. So we're going to skim over a lot of that today because we've got so much to cover the history of the show. But when you were here, we talked about how you hunted down Buffalo Bob and actually, in a liquor store. And, and actually, you were a little pain in the butt to him at first. I was, a, I was a big pain in the butt to him. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you the story. As briefly as I know how, okay. uh, and you can interrupt at any given moment, which I wanna, you will. I, I want to interrupt right away, Go. because we were watching the opening clip of, yeah. of the little yeah. girl singing, and you pointed to Bob's outfit. Yeah. and It got eerie, for you and I, I think. For both you got to tell everybody why. Well, uh, what, 
well, let me just show it first. But here is this is bu- it. This is the buffalo suit that that Bob wore. Um, this was the reason it's this color is it was for color television back then. He started in a brown suit, then went to a blue suit. And for you television people that know what chroma key is, when chroma key was invented, they had to get rid of blue because yeah. he disappeared. And they went to the the a color that was as much beyond blue as they could. And this was it. So this there's the buffalo, or as he would say, here's the old buffalo. Yeah. And that's it. So we've got this. Uh, that got- is. How did you? Did he will that to you? Um, well, I actually had two suits. He gave me one, which is a which was a blue suit. So I have that. And then um, when he passed, um, his sons, who are grown, grown, grown men, came to me and knew nothing about Howdy really, because they was their father was Bob's was dad, not Buffalo Bob. They, and, wait a minute. So they didn't watch the show? Not really. I mean, like most kids, though. But no, like most kids. I mean, if you went to Paul Winchell's kids or any of those kids. They that was they wanted their father. I remember saying to Chris Bergen once. I had um, met Chris Bergen through a very good friend of of his, and um, I said to him, um, "If you could have a Charlie McCarthy, and you get one built now for yourself, wouldn't you want that?" And he looked at me right in the face. He said, "No." He said, "I'd like my dad." You know, that's interesting because Candace had issues with Charlie, too. Yeah, but not anymore. She, she got over all that. She had major yeah. issues. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, so my, my meeting with Bob. Yeah. So I was on the playground. I was about, to, about 10 years old at Trinity School in New Rochelle, New York. And some kid actually said that Buffalo Bob had a liquor store in New Rochelle, which was, that would be like saying Mr. Rogers had a liquor store or Captain Kangaroo had a liquor store. It made no sense. But this sort of kept going and going and what i finally said where is the liquor store and this kid whoever the heck he was knew and said it was on the north end of nourishell i was there at the south end of nourishell that's where i lived so i found out the address of the liquor store i left school one day i didn't tell anybody meaning my parents i got on the m as in mary bus and um and i'll bet there still is an m bus and went from the south end of nourishell to the north end of nourishell in a place called Waikiki, got off the bus, and there was a big sign that said liquors. And I walked in as any good 10 year old kid would walk into a liquor store, and I said, Excuse me, is Buffalo Bob here? And there was a man behind the counter with check shirt and glasses like similar to this, and he looked at me and said, I'm Buffalo Bob. Well, that was impossible because he wasn't wearing this, <laughs> he was dressed normally. And I, 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 I didn't believe it was Buffalo Bob, but as he was talking, that booming voice became it became apparent that it was him so i asked him for his autograph he gave me a picture which i still have signed to me and i continued going back and back and back and we became believe it or not best of friends and then eventually he gave me tickets like 11 tickets to go to the show and 11 uh, 11 which was like then was like worth a million dollars yeah because they only held 40 or 50 kids that's right and most of them were sponsors kids yeah so yeah. anyway that's a short short version of how we met and i was friendly with him till the day and, he passed away and you did the same thing to lou anderson clarabelle L- yes i i um Yes. I found out his name. There was a magazine. There was TV Guide for Adults. There was TV Junior for Kids for a little while. And um, in it, it said, had a picture of him putting his makeup on. And it said his name was Lou Anderson. And he lived in White Plains, New York. Well, that's all I had to hear. So I went to the phone book. I found a couple of Lou Andersons. I finally got to him. And uh, I called him up. And I'll I'll say it because it doesn't matter anymore. His phone number was White Plains nine three two zero two. That's the, uh, that was the number. And don't, I just don't call that number uh, if you're in that area. Please don't bother. And I just there. spoke to his wife actually the other day, oh. yesterday, and we were talking about that. And um, again, he and I became very very close friends, and ultimately it helped you know start me in television. Now we will have a few surprises clip wise for everybody toward the end of the show but uh, you did go to the Howdy Doody taping uh, or actually it was a taping we can say that because by the point you went they were shooting in color on videotape. Yeah but let me push harder than you for a minute that if you watch today everybody should know that we're going to see a lot of video of Howdy Doody some of which you've never seen before so if you're listening you may want to 
click and oh, how we how we do oh, good it. point because yeah uh, uh, Bert and I were talking before we went on the air and for some reason and it's falling in place today we're split right down the middle again we've got uh, like a thousand people now total I've got 500 I've got the TV uh, thing up here 550 some people watching us and 520 some listening so that's a good point if you want to see these clips and not just listen to them switch over to the television channel and then now. you can ha you can watch and listen actually yeah. two things at yeah. once yeah. anyway Ab absolutely yeah uh, okay so um uh, uh, Lou Anderson, uh, Lou, Bob passed away in '98, yeah. and Lou passed away in 2005. Yeah, I spoke at his funeral, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I started to say when you went to the television taping mm -hmm. uh, with your, did you bring ten friends with you? I brought. I don't think I brought ten. I don't know that I had ten, <laughs> but, but I did bring some friends. Yeah, yeah. A couple of girls actually that I yeah. want to get in good with. And uh, I at ten years old, uh -huh. you were oh, wow, oh, yeah. wow, wow, wow. You you had you didn't have a latency. No, 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 no. I, I, um, I actually did. They Look that up. That's a psych term. <laughs> um, so anyway, I went and I remember it like it was yesterday because I didn't have a color set. The show was broadcast in color then. I did not have a color set. So to walk in and see these beautiful colors and see Bob's suit, you know, which to me looked black or blue, you know, in black and white television, and to see Howdy and Clarabelle's suit was green and white. I also own Clarabelle suit, by the way, too. I, Lou Anderson gave me the oh. suit, so I have. I could do the show in my living room, pr pretty much. Let's do that. Yes. If we if we do a sequel, and we've Let's got a surprise it. sitting here, which we'll get to later. Yes, we'll absolutely. Later. One, one surprise per hour. Let's let, okay, let's right. do it that way. But uh, did you show off for your friends at the studio? It's like I know Buffalo Bob, and you, you know, I didn't have to. I did tell them I knew him, but. Right before the show, they do what it's called the television warm up, and we're going to talk about that because yeah. that determined how many kids sat in the peanut gallery. It's an interesting story that he uh, has. But and you've done television warm up, so you know. Yeah. So they did the warm up, and Bob came. They introduced Bob, and he came through the cameras. I'll never I, I, like it was yesterday, and he yelled out, "Where's my buddy Bert?" And every oh. friend of mine that was sitting in the peanut gallery went out of their minds, and oh. he's an introduce me to your friends, and it was just it was. I, I, literally a dream come true. Now, we were trying to figure out when I talked to you last week, because they were on tape at this point, whether you skipped school for this or whether they taped after school. That you don't remember. I don't remember, but I, I think they must have taped after school. I because think... I read in Stephen Davis's book, which is an excellent book, by the way, and I'll show it later on. It's it's out of print now, but you can find used copies of it. And Bert has mentioned throughout that, that whole book that they did three or four tapings in one day by that point. So I, I, th I asked uh, you whether you had sat through more than one show. No, no, I, I did one. and I, I Now, I had been to more than one show i had been to the show two or three different times but um only one you know per per day that I, that I went to yeah and it was it, it was magic and they did it as if it were live they didn't stop yeah and i've got a clip to that effect that we're going to run later from the val carney show. yes which we'll yeah. <laughs> you know exactly what i'm talking and about and my friend elliot is now in long, in long island laughing as he hears val carney yeah and we'll oh. talk about him <laughs> we'll talk about the film or east album later and yeah talk about elliot too. okay um uh uh so I've been promoting this show like crazy for the last month, and actually some of the guests that I've had here in the studio, Stuart Pankin was here a few weeks ago, and I told him about this because I was in the peanut gallery. Yeah. Uh, and I talked to uh, Alan Eichler, who was Sally Kellerman's manager, who was, we had lunch with him yesterday, and I said, um, uh, I'm doing a Howdy Doody show. Oh, I was in the peanut gallery. After reading Stephen's book, and after talking to St Stuart Pankin said the biggest shock to him, and he saw the show around 52, he was about six or seven years old, 52 years old, he said the biggest shock to him, um, because, you know, you, you have an image of, of, at that age, you have an image of what the show might be like, and then when you go there in person, some of that gets shattered because of the cameras and the way things, sure, and sure. It, it, it's artificial and not real the way you picture at home, but he said the scariest thing was that Clarabelle was yelling at the kids before the show I, uh, and listen i've heard those stories over and over and over again and all this was I, a clown that never talked okay and uh, that that was that was the shock to him and it was bob keishan probably then who was clarabelle not not Luke. and the, the, they don't paint a very nice picture of bob keishan in the book well yes and and here's why um, it really had nothing to do with Keishan at all. It had everything to do with Bob Smith and Bobby Nicholson and a lot of the people that, were, that did the show. Bob Smith came from the school that if you did not play a musical instrument or you didn't sing, you had no talent. That's where that was the school he came and from, and that's what Bob Keishan was in those days. He couldn't sing and he couldn't dance, right? Which didn't, which uh, obviously 
didn't mean he had no talent because he had the last laugh. He became Captain Kangaroo. But they ended up firing Keishin and a bunch of them at one at one time. They they were all gone. And Bob Smith never really had the nicest things to say about Keishin, but his experience was his experience. I got to know Keishin quite well, and he was a gentleman to me. And I would also say about the character, the Clarabelle character, I don't think that ever, they, there was constantly being invented and being invented and the Clarabelle that was on originally that Keishan did was a very different Clarabelle than what Lou Anderson did so at, I mean the truth is when you're sitting at a television show you're going to see things you're not supposed to see now who knows if he was yelling he may have been speaking but it may have seemed like he was yelling because there he was in full makeup speaking and as kids we didn't even think that he had the ability to talk so who right, knows right and happened. that was what Stuart was saying was yeah. that was a big shock to him yeah. to go there and all of a sudden Clarabelle's not only talking but he's saying sit down and shut up oh i've heard people <laughs> I've, I've heard people say that he had a cigar in his mouth i mean i've heard i've heard, I've heard over and over i've heard a yeah. million things yeah not my experience and you met bob keishan and he couldn't have been lovelier to you uh, let me tell you real quickly how i met bob keishan my first job in television was at uh, 1970 whatever it was at the wls in chicago which was the abc owned and operated station and this was abc remember I read in the newspaper that Bob Keishan was coming in and he was going to do a speech somewhere. He was on CBS. So technically, not really supposed to be on ABC. I called up his office and said, I'm, my name is Bert Dubra, blah, blah, blah. And I do the show called Kennedy and Company. And just give him a message and tell him that I know Bob Smith very well. Within, seemed like minutes, I got a phone call from Bob Keishan. And he called right back and asked about my relationship with Bob. I told him. And he said, I'm not supposed to do this, but if you will go out to breakfast with me after the show, I will come and do the show. And pay for the breakfast. A a a and I paid for the breakfast. And uh, anyway, not only did he come, Stu, but he came with full makeup as Captain Kangaroo. He brought, I'll never forget it. He had a briefcase with, not a briefcase, a case with two styrofoam heads in them with two wigs for, uh, of Kangaroo, you know, of Captain Kangaroo. And he did the whole thing in character for me. All he wanted to do afterwards was talk about bob smith he wanted to hear me say that bob loved him and all that which by the way i couldn't say this is what's so ironic about this is that it sounds like it was a one-way street smith didn't like him but keishan idolized bob well beyond idolized i mean um he only wanted right to the day he died he wanted bob's seal of approval and if you think about kangaroo and you think about howdy Howdy, Kangaroo was nothing more than the opposite of Howdy. Howdy was a screaming, crazy show with kids going, and Captain Kangaroo was nice and calm. And that's how he told me this. That's sort of how it came about. And that's he, why it's hard for me to see Keishan in Clarabelle garb yelling and screaming at kids, because I grew up on Kangaroo. I barely remember Howdy. I was four when the show went off. But I vividly remember Mr. Green Jeans and, and this very low-key guy in this you know big coat talking to us and telling us stories. And that's why it's hard for me yeah. to vision. Are, are you old enough to remember? Remember Keishan as Clarabelle? No, uh, only video, uh, only yeah. video. But no, I'm not. But old you enough. can tell the difference between Keishan's Clarabelle and Lou's and Bobby Nicholson. Nicholson can, did it for a while. I can tell the difference in. And yeah. This is nothing to brag about, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can tell the difference with three of them. And they were all three very different Clarabels. Clarabelle had not really been uh, developed yet when Keishan did it. Yeah. And when Nick did it, Nick came in because they got rid of Keishan. Yeah. And Nick was such a talented guy, you know, uh, actor and comedian that we'll see we'll see later on video yeah. here, that he didn't want to do it anymore because he wanted to speak. Yeah. And then Lou had no desire, didn't even know what hit him. And he, I was going to say probably, he was definitely the best cloud. Oh, yeah. He was the yeah. most beloved. That's, Absolute, that's for the sure. The cutest, most um, adorable. Um, uh, but as far as as far as I, I lost my train of thought, I was going to ask you something about Keishan's performances back in those days. Um, well, let, he was let, an angry. He was very angry. He would constantly stomp his feet, and he'd have a you know this kind of look on his face. And yeah. the makeup, um, which interestingly enough was developed yeah. by Dick Smith, the makeup artist, yes. who did all those horror movies later yeah. and all that. Yeah. He was the makeup yeah, guy. There's a very this, fine line between clowns being funny and creepy. Mark Evanier had it on his blog today, and he's so so right about yeah. that. Here's what I, I remembered. What I want to ask you, Ke didn't. 
Keishan walk off the show early on, uh, and and then they got him back like a week later when they realized they didn't. I, I thought not I read that, that somewhere of. in Stephen's book. Uh, um, not that I know of. Okay, so, somebody uh, walked off the show and they because re- uh, oh, you know what? Maybe it was Frank Paris. Maybe that's Frank what Paris saying. did walk yeah, off the show. Yeah, yes. we'll, we'll, yeah. We'll, we've yeah. got to identify all of these people. Yeah. Uh, why don't Why don't we get into the history of this now? Let's talk talk tell everybody a little bit about Bob Smith, how he was brought up, where he was brought up, and his radio career, and how Howdy was a spinoff of the radio show. Well, Bob was brought up in Buffalo. Uh, there Buffalo you, Bob there, Smith, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, by the way, a lot of people d- didn't realize. Yeah. And he was brought up, as I recall, he and I talking, by a pretty strict um, father. I don't know about his mom, but uh, pr- pretty strict. And uh, uh, Bob was sort of that way. He was a pretty, he was a, he was a taskmaster. Both, his real name was? Uh, Bob, Robert E. Schmidt. And um, he was he did a lot of radio entertaining in Buffalo. I uh, ended up on the radio. I uh, ended up with the number one radio show in Buffalo, singing, doing some jokes, had some other guys with him. Uh, the ultimate sort of entertainer back then. And um, NBC heard about him in New York, and they were trying to find somebody to compete with Arthur Godfrey, who was number one. You couldn't touch Arthur Godfrey. So they called Bob up. Actually, Kate Smith, who was on his show in Buffalo, recommended to NBC they look at Bob Smith. So Bob went down. He ended up on the radio competing um, with Arthur Godfrey and did uh, on. I'm mean, just, he worked his you know what off. And he ended up doing a Saturday kid show. Um, and all of a sudden, why did I forget the name of the kid show? Um, but anyway, it was a sort of a game show for kids. This is on the radio. This is on the radio. And his engineer said to him one day, do you do any characters? Just to sort of split it up a little bit. Um, and so he said, well, let's try. So they came up with sort of an Elmer... Uh, 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 more like a Mortimer, Mortimer Snurl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, that he called Elmer. That they called Elmer. Yeah. The character's name was Elmer. So... Bob would like start this little bit and he'd say, hi, Elmer. And Elmer would go, well, howdy doody. Just as instead of hello, he'd say howdy doody. They'd do a little hee-haw kind of stuff. And then as he left, he'd go, he'd say, bye, Elmer. He'd go, howdy doody. Well, kids actually came in as an audience on that radio show. And the kids would come in and the first thing they would say, they wouldn't say, where's Elmer? They'd say, where's howdy doody? So that gave them one idea. Let's change the name. So they immediately changed the name. Then the television people, this is like in 1947. We're looking for a kid show. And they were talking to Paul Winchell. They were talking to Bob Smith. They were talking to a bunch. And so Bob had this game show and this 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 character. Now, you didn't have a puppet because it was radio. And Nobody it was Bob's voice doing the dumb Bob's guy. Voice. Yeah, yeah. So they decided on Howdy Doody. Yeah. So they ended up putting together a television show like in a minute and a half. And there was a guy named Frank Paris who had a, a show on, on Channel 11 in New York, had a bunch of puppets anyway. So they brought brought him in, hired him. He had a, a bunch of puppets in a show called Toby Tyler's Circus. So he stole some of these puppets, and one of them became Howdy Doody, this ugly piece of crap-looking character. Oh, you're going to see it in yeah. a moment. <laughs> and, and it just, it, it was horrible looking. Yeah. But they didn't have any time to do anything. They had right. to get on the air. So, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. I was just going to ask you, is this when he met Roger Muir and Martin Stone at NBC? Let's, yeah. let's bring, and Eddie Keene, let's they bring assigned, in all those key people. Okay. They assigned Roger, who was just a staff producer, and uh, Eddie Keene, who was writing for the radio show, to come in. Roger produced it. Eddie would write. And that whole and Martin Stone was part of this group too. He ended up managing Bob, and they began this television show with this puppet. Now there was no Buffalo Bob. He was Mr. Smith. There was no Peanut Gallery. There were kids on sawhorses in the audience, and they were older kids, like teenagers, like yeah. young teenagers, yeah. like fourteen-year-olds. Yes, yes, you're, you're going to see this. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and um, so anyway, that began. But I think the part you want me to get to was this ugly. Howdy, that we ended up calling Ugly Duty. I mean, that's pretty much what everybody, <laughs> everybody called them. Um, scared the living hell out of the kids. And it wasn't a happy character. As we said, it was a Mortimer Snurdish kind of character. So they decided they're going to find a way to get rid of him. So they decided to run Howdy for president 
of all the kids. It was an election year. Okay, so why don't we, do you want to show the clip of that first before we talk about how, the transition from the ugly howdy to the howdy we it's know? your show? Do it to <laughs> well, show. I'm no, just a guest. I know, I know you're just a guest, but you know a hell of a lot more about this than I do. Do what you got to so, do. So let me, let me ask you, uh, uh, so they, ran, they decide to run howdy for president, and what we have here is this your kinescope? Do we give credit to Chance or to Jack for well, this? We, we, by the way, we give credit. We give no credit to Chance. We give no credit to Jack. We That's give, Bert saying that, give, guys, not me. We give all the credit to you and me because we're here. <laughs> all right? And they're now listening. And very, no. This, this is, no, what we want to establish here, this is the oldest surviving kinescope of Howdy Doody. It went on the air two days after Christmas, yeah, 1947. Yeah, and, we, yeah, and, we, and by the way, we'll, we'll give we'll give Jack credit for helping us out with all this, and my buddy Chance, who we'll talk about later. Yeah, Chance was the one who saved me a ton of work by compiling all the clips and that if, Bert gave me. And if Jack is listening, let me just say, we're going to talk about Gumby, Jack. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Gumby made his debut on Howdy Doody. Yes, yes. We yeah. just talked about it, Jack. Yeah, he made his debut on Howdy Doody. <laughs> right. l let, let me... Is this where we're showing the both of them together? No, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. This, okay. is, this is the June 1948. What I was trying to say is, Howdy went on the air uh, uh, for the first time was it a Saturday and uh, two days uh, yeah, after Christmas? Winter. It was a winter and it was a big snowstorm. So they had a built-in audience. Nobody could leave the house. And it was just, it, was a, it wasn't, it was it sold as a series at that point or was it a one-shot? I, I think they did three days a week at that point. So, and, and it was an hour. It, yeah, originally, yes. Yeah, okay. I can't, ima I can't so, imagine. So but, yeah. Bert just explained that that's how he's running for president of the kids of the United States. This yes, is when yes. Truman was running as the real president. Oh, God, do we need Truman today? Yeah. But we won't, go, we won't go there. So what we're going to see right now is about a minute and a half of the only surviving kinescope with the original Howdy duty puppet right yes that what we're seeing yes I want to make sure i push the right do button. you have the right button there i think i do okay i think i do so here we go take a look at this june 20th 1940 history history you'll love it oh this is a uh, this is a message for you howdy do your personal message for me well let me see it mr smith it's right here it's coming in howdy now read it would you please all right um your doohickey, oh, look, it's for me, Mr. Smith. Your doohickey is almost as silly as you are. Well, for heaven's sake, you should sell it to a junk dealer or don't you collect pennies. Signed, Mr. X and Mr. Huff. Why can't you, why, how can those fellas have the nerve of, what is that, Mr. O. Huff and Mr. O. X? What are they me? Howdy now, don't, don't get yourself excited. Get up and sing your song. Come on, boys, sing your howdy duty song. Heaven. Howdy duty for president. He's America's choice. And he will never be hesitant. He'll fight for the rights of girls and boys. That's my howdy duty, Sam. Howdy duty for Crayles of them. You're in, howdy. Beyond the White House he'll be. Howdy duty for President. Let's sweep them onto victory. Ah, oh, boy, howdy. I don't think we'll have any time for it. Oh, I know we won't have time. There's our old cuckoo cuckooing. So come on over here, kids, will you? It's time to say so long, everybody. Be careful of the tables, if you will, as you come over. Howdy, we'll all get together. Ask all the boys and girls to join us in the singing of our theme until Thursday. What do we say, kids? Howdy. It's howdy, howdy duty time. time. Good. Let's sing it real loud. Come on. It's howdy duty time. It's howdy duty time. Say so long, everybody. That's the way. And so long, howdy doody. So long, kids, and howdy doody for president. <laughs> Yes, those Woody Allen's relatives made up the peanut gallery there. Did you take a look at those kids? I mean, <laughs> well, you can't say kids. Those <laughs> no, are, those were teenagers. I, I know. No, yeah. no, I mean, I wonder if they were just friends of people that worked on the show there, just to get some some bodies. I, I don't care what they were; they didn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> they did not look good. But you know, it, 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 you look at that now, and certainly it's so ancient. So ancient. But it's such a part of television Un history. Do you realize how rare that is? That is the only surviving kinescope of the original Howdy Doody. And boy, was that thing ugly. Were we right about that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it was. So so let's continue the story now. Yeah, right? fr Frank Paris had a 
contract to, to, to dispute with them. Well, or yeah, well, well, briefly, so Frank Paris is the guy who uh, made that puppet, and I, I told you that earlier. So um, the show, st believe it or not, <laughs> that show started to become big, believe it or not, with that puppet. Well, there was no competition. Uh, well, for it. <laughs> true. I know, but you could have shut it off. Uh, people just didn't shut it off. So that snowstorm lasted longer than we think it lasted. Well, and television was brand new. Yeah. There was nothing to watch. So Macy's or Gimbel's, I forget which one, called up Bob. And Roger Muir, the producer, and said, we'd like to make these Howdy Doody dolls as merch, you know, for merchandise purposes. And again, this is the beginning of television merchandise. It hadn't even really existed yet. So um, Bob said, great, you know, let's do that because it was more money in his pocket and more some money for NBC. Oh, those were words that are going to come back very quickly. So yeah. Frank Paris jumped in and said, wait a minute, that's my puppet. I own that puppet. You can't do this without me. Well... Guess what? He didn't own the puppet. NBC bought it from him. They bought it. They paid him for that puppet, and Bob owned the rights to the name Howdy Doody. So Frank was now working for NBC. Didn't matter. He didn't like that. They had an argument, and Frank took his puppet and left the studio. And he took, he, he took Rhoda Mann, the lady who was operating the puppet with, or was he operating the no, puppet? No, he was operating. Rhoda okay. wasn't there yet. No. Oh, oh okay. No. Right. So, um, so this, he took the puppet and left. And Did they try to sue him or anything? There was a big lawsuit. It wasn't that he tried. they tried to sue him. He tried to sue NBC. And by the way, he did, and he settled. They paid him some money, but he lost his job, and the puppet, according to the court papers, had to be burned. Okay. Yes, and Bert said to me during the clip while you guys were watching, it said, ask me what happened to the puppet. So it burned? Well, you didn't ask me. What happened to the puppet? Here's what happened to the puppet. <laughs> Thank I, you. I learned this about a year and a half ago, and it's the strangest story. Um, I'm a big fan, always a big fan of The Love and Spoonful, John Sebastian and The Love and Spoonful. And a friend of mine, Bobby Baruch, was doing a movie with him, just putting together a film. And he called me one day and said, I just picked John up from the airport. This is about a year ago. And um, John, I told John all about you, and he really wants to come and meet you. Well, I was excited. I, was, I wanted to meet John Sebastian. So they came over to CNN, and we sat in his car in the parking lot at CNN, and John told me the following story. John's parents were writers. They wrote for, like, the Jack Parr show and a lot of those shows back then in the early 50s. And they were, lived down in the, in the village, and they were sort of beatniks, which would sort of explain... John, you know, and John was no more than four or five years old. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a babysitter, he would always go to these parties with them. And there were always these East Village parties. So he's at a, he never told anybody this until about a year ago when he told me. And he was at a party one night and he was like under the table, as he remembers it, because it was all adults. And this guy got up and there were probably 20, 30 people at the party and starts telling a story. It was this guy's apartment where the party was taking place about of this television show that he did and he created a puppet for it and he sued and he ended up getting a settlement and I was supposed to burn the puppet, he said. But look at this. And he pulls out one of those ironing boards from the wall. John Sebastian's telling me this. And out from the wall comes that puppet or a duplicate of that puppet. Who, Not would, be, sure. who would want to copy that thing? Who knows? <sighs> but anyway, so either, either there was a duplicate or the puppet was never burned. But to hear that story from John Sebastian of The Love and Spoonful... John and I have become friends since then. That is that is amazing. I know. That is I, remarkable. Yeah, that's what Now, happened. we were watching this, um, and in the book that I read uh, to do the pre-production on this program today, uh, we were talking about how Buffalo Bob was not a ventriloquist, nope. how he had to move his lips when he was doing the voice of Howdy, mm -hmm. and at some point they started to pre-record Howdy's tracks so that the two of them could talk together in the camera well explain how the camera worked well, in the days when he had to do both voices well it, it, and, and this was separate so the kids couldn't even see this in the studio uh no the kids actually could see it the kids could see it in the so, studio. so there's there's another another artificial thing burst of course yeah. i mean and again this is early television right. so they were just trying to figure right. figure it all okay. out so explain how what the, ca how so, the cameras okay, so there were two cameras there was one on bob and there was three and there was one on howdy and there was well, then there was a camera on both of them when bob would say hey do it with me uh, uh do it with me okay right. you be you be howdy for a second, okay? okay. So uh, hold on. <laughs> yeah. So I would say, I would say, uh, hey howdy, how you doing? Cut to howdy. I'm doing fine, Buffalo Bob. 
See, and when that's going oh, so on, it's the same bu- way I'm cutting between us. Right. Here. Okay. So, in other words, if I'm Buffalo Bob, I'm doing your voice, the Howdy's voice, but you don't see me doing the voice because we cut to the shot of Howdy. Right. So that's really how it worked until Bob wanted to sing. And again, this was a man that was music all the way. That was his life. So he thought to himself, "I can do duets with Howdy, but there's but we got to record it." So they actually took acetates or records, seventy-eight and, unrecorded seventy-eight discs, and Bob would do. Howdy's part, just Howdy's part. Prior to the show. Prior to the show. And literally the audio guy would sit there and Bob would say his thing and the guy would hold with his finger down the record, the acetate, and then when Howdy was to talk, he let his finger up the audio of Howdy's voice would go. When it stopped, it would go down. Now, this this is live television. There must have been times when the audio guy let go and Howdy went, but, blah, blah, blah. but not a lot. Yeah. So interestingly yeah. enough, not a lot. Mm-hmm. So this allowed them to do duets together, and it was the, that was and, the beginning And we saw it. in the clip, by, ni- by June of 48, six months into the run, they had already perfected that. Yes. Because yes. if you watch the clip carefully, he's still strumming the banjo after the music has stopped. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, eventually it went to tape and all that, and it got you know so much better. Sophisticated. But, much, yeah, much more, yeah. Yeah. But it was really quite innovative at the time. We have to talk now about how the Howdy Duty puppet uh, marionette that we've come to know yeah. and love uh, uh, got got created, and and coincidentally, they went to artists here on the West Coast. Didn't yes. They? Well, here's what happened. Um, so they decided they had to get rid of that puppet, as you as everybody just saw in your audience. There was good reason to get rid of that puppet. <laughs> so Eddie Keen, the brilliance and genius of Eddie Keen, who was the writer on the show, the only writer, and created Mr. Bluster, Dilly Dally, the Flubber Dub, the Inspector, the Talkascope, the Talker, everything that we grew up. Howdy. He created all of them. So, Did he have a vision in his own mind of what these guys should look like? Uh, no, he really didn't. Milt Neal, who was an artist on the show, Milt Neal would draw them. And then a guy named Scott Brinker, not Howdy, the other puppets, then Scott Brinker would make them. So that's really what... Eddie would come up with the character, what the character's personality was. Scott, Scott, uh, Ed, uh, Milt Neal would draw it, Scott would build it. That's how it worked. Wow, so it was a truly a team effort oh, God, on every yeah. one of these things. Oh, God, yes. So, so talk, talk, talk so anyway, about Howdy. So here's what happened. So they decided, how, Eddie decided, how are we going to get rid of Howdy? Well, if he's going to run for president of all the kids, he's got to go away. He's got to go on an election tour and, and meet all of his potential you know, voters. So he's gone. Out, he's gone. So And Frank Paris took the puppet, so it all worked out. So that's how that played out. Now, while he was gone, they needed another puppet. So a guy by the name of Norm Blackburn, who was a programming guy, knew a lady out here in California, in actually um, Palm Springs, California, by the name of Velma Dawson, who had done a lot of things, worked with Edgar Bergen, but she made puppets and, and he knew her, they were friends. So called her and said, can you make us a puppet quickly if we get you a drawing? Well, two gentlemen from the Disney studios sort of drew this character based on Bob doing a voice. Not the same voice, a little different voice, a little happier voice. Not as dumb sounding. Right. So the voice, Bob talked on the phone. They got the voice. They got these drawings. The drawings went to Velma Dawson. And in a matter of three weeks, Velma Dawson built this iconic puppet that we're sitting here talking Three about. Three painting, yeah. sanding, everything, everything? Everything. She d- did everything. And what they did, so they built this whole storyline. He's on a campaign tour. He's this. And then finally they said, you know what, kids? And they really said this. Howdy is going to get a little plastic surgery because his running mate, Mr. X, is very, very handsome. We and need to explain about Mr. X. I will. Okay. His running mate, Mr. X, is very handsome, and he's getting all the votes from all the little girls. So Howdy's going to have a little, little nip and tuck. Okay, that was their way of saying Velma's building a puppet. You know? <laughs> and so finally when the day came, oh no. So during this time, the sponsors were getting very upset. They were getting angry because they wanted Howdy to do commercials. Live commercials were huge then. So they took an actual marionette, any marionette, and they wrapped bandages around his face. And they said, Howdy's back, but he had this plastic surgery. So the sponsors were happy he would do the commercials. They With the bandages? Were, oh, yes. This is exposing kids to the medical industry uh, uh, at age yeah. six. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and so, so finally when Howdy was finished and Velma shipped him from California to New York, they took that 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 marionette they wrapped bandages around his head and they unveiled that night 
the howdy doody that we all have grown to know and love. Now, do we have an approximate uh, date on this? Would it be about two months before the actual election? September of 48, it, it, it somewhere? Was so, I, I want to say it was June. I think it was June. Well, the sure. clip we just ran of Ugly Howdy was June 20. I know, but I think it was around June that he was unveiled. That's all. And, and by the way, I wouldn't swear to it, but I think so. So so this this Howdy Duty that we just, the clip we just ran was one of the last ones to use the Ugly Puppet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, Interesting. he was unveiled and, you know, he was the all-American boy. And then you want to talk about merchandising? That's when the mer- merchandising. Was yeah, I want to. I want to get to that. But uh, was it NBC or was it Roger Muir that was nervous about something happening to the puppet once it was finished? Roger Muir. Well, well, Roger. What I'm doing here is setting up for the next clip. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. They were invited to uh, Washington D.C. on the steps of uh, oh gosh, uh, on the steps of the Capitol in Washington. Bob Howdy. The whole group, they all went there at Clarabelle, and they did, uh, I think it was I Am President's Day or something like that. And they did this, then they got back on the plane, could go do the show that night, and when they got off the plane, Howdy was cracked right down the middle of his head because of the pressure of being up in the air. So it never occurred to them to have another puppet, so they thought, we better get another one. So they called Velma, but Roger, instead of getting uh, Howdy as exactly that way, he wanted more animation. So he wanted his eyes to blink separately. He wanted his eyes to go back and forth. The other Howdy, both eyes went down, and that was the end of it. So Velma explained to him, to Roger, if you do that, he's going to look different. No, 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 we don't care. He'll look the same. Please build it. So she couldn't convince him. So Velma built the other Howdy, and they built, kept this storyline going of Mr. X, Mr. X, Mr. X, who was Howdy's running mate, but who was Mr. X? Nobody knew. So finally, at the last day of this whole thing, when he finally won for president, Mr. X made an appearance. Should we show the clip? Yes, and when you see, well, let's, I think we should say what it is, Mr. X, well, you'll see who Mr. X was, and then on the other side of that, we'll keep it. We'll right, okay, so here's, uh, this is November 2nd, 1948, about five months after the other howdy departed. Get, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. so here we go. This is a, a, a November 2nd, the big election of howdy duty for president for the kids. Take a look. Cream just awful anxious. Are the kids I hope as anxious as I am to see who's president? How are you, kids? Are you anxious to see who's going to be president? Yeah. Come on, Clarabella. Now let's wait no time here. You take care of the vote meter. Now this is the final count, don't forget. That's the way. Now we turn it on right over here. There we have it now. What does it say? Presidential election. The new president. Wait, wait, wait just a minute, Clarabelle. Howdy wants to see this too. Come on up here, Howdy. Atta boy, come on. Howdy wants to see this more than anybody in the world. Now what do we have here? The next president. Can you see all right, Howdy? Atta boy. Of the kids is Mr. X. 901,442 votes. <gasps> Gosh, that's a lot of votes. Come on, Howdy, let's look at the rest of it. 11 million, 11 million, 896,986 votes, kids. Let's see what else it says. Now, wait a minute. The new president of the kids of the United is Howdy Duty. Hey, we're in Howdy Duty. We're in Howdy Duty. 11 million votes. How do you feel? Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yes, look, look. Well, for heaven. Well, for heaven. Well, Clarabelle, look, well, I don't understand, are, are, are you Mr. X? Oh, 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 wowie, why sure I'm Mr. X, don't, don't I look like you thought I'd look? Why, this is impossible, you, you look just like Howdy Doody, how can you be Mr. X, what is your real name? My name is Mr. X. Well, wait, what do you say? Sh- shall we tell him double, huh? Well, I sure, I, I guess we kept the kids and Mr. Smith and Clarabelle in suspense long enough. Well, kids and, and Mr. Smith, 
I want you to meet my twin brother, Double Duty. Come on, you tell everybody a story, Double, would you please? Well, it, it's really very simple, kids. You see, I'm Howdy Duty's twin brother, Double Duty. And I'm also Mr. X. Yeah. You see, months ago, when Howdy Duty decided to run for president, well, Howdy and I got together and worked out a little plan. In other words, you pretended to be Mr. X, and you made Mr. X seem so awful that, that nobody would vote for him, and then everybody would vote for Howdy Duty. Is that what you did? Well, that's exactly it. Well, I made this Mr. X character so awful that, well, everybody liked Howdy Doody so much more. Would you show us all double duty? Would you show us uh, how you talk like Mr. X for just a minute? Would you show us how to do that? Oh, I'll be glad to. All right. Go well, ahead. hello, boys and girls. This is double duty talking now. You know, when I put my hands up to my mouth like this. Oh. But this is also the voice of Mr. X. Oh, look at that kid. Hooray for Mr. X. Look. Vote for Mr. X. Vote for Mr. X. And that's how it was done. Right, Bert? Well, let's continue the story now. <laughs> okay. So what happened was is that second puppet that you saw was the one I was describing that Velma had to make with the eyes like that. But it didn't really look like Howdy. It certainly resembled Howdy. So that, what you just saw, was the last time you ever saw those two puppets together so what they did is they thought what are we going to do we have a puppet here so again eddie keen came up with a character whose name was inspector john j fiduzel america's number one and then his eye would go down private eye and like then there that. was a boing wasn't yeah, there, there was, was a boing. something like you have this a boing? let's do it okay america's number one private eye right exactly so anyway we aim to please here so and that had to do with that eye going down that, yeah. that roger wanted yeah. so what happened was scott brinker in his genius and he was a brilliant guy he took that puppet that second howdy turned it into the inspector john j fiduzel wow and that was the only time you ever saw that and that's where the inspector so the inspector came from the brain of eddie keen but it came from the hands of Velma and Scott Brinker. That is unbelievable. Yeah. That's yeah. really remarkable. I know. It's, now so, we can talk about the licensing. This is where Buffalo Bob and Martin Stone really cleaned They, they made more money on that than they were make doing the show, right? Yeah, well, they did, there was everything. They came up just from that, from Gimbel's, Macy's Calling, to, to make that Howdy Doody doll. Yeah. All of a sudden, there were halloween suits there were there were tablecloths there were hats there were everything you could think of and this is pre which we'll get to later this is pre disney this is before yeah. all the yeah. disney mayhem so they how do you, you know bob and uh, martin stone who really was the genius behind that came up with that now in the midst of this like in about 53 or something like that bob took the rights because he owned everything up to then and sold them to nbc which is why NBC owns Howdy to this day, the, the rights. Sold all the rights for a lot Including of money. Including the merchandising? Especially the merchandising. So that's when he became a millionaire, basically. Yes, yes, he, he did very well. But at that time, he was doing the Howdy Doody show on television, the Howdy Doody show on radio, a variety show during the week, and a golf, G-U-L-F golf show once a week. He was crazy busy which is one of the reasons he, he had, had a heart, heart attack, attack in 54 and right. in his 30s basically right. That's right. let let me um let me ask you one other thing before we break let's let's get bobby keishan on board and let's get dayton allen and judy tyler who came a little bit later right well let's, yeah. let's get the principles and then we'll take our first break well very quickly um there were all guys on the show so it was it was um bob clarabelle uh, Chief Thunderthud, Bill Cornick, Dayton Allen, who was doing Bluster and Dilly Dally and the Inspector. I mean, not Bluster, the Inspector, the Flubba Dub's voice. Bill Cornick did Dilly Dally. Uh, it was all guys. And so they they needed a female presence somewhere. So they came up uh, with a female puppet, and that was Princess Summer Fall Winter Spring. It was originally a puppet. Originally a puppet. And then they decided at a certain point it should be a real person. There was a girl on Broadway that was uh, doing a show on Broadway. Her name was Judy Tyler. Well, they saw her on Broadway, flipped out, and the puppet became uh, a real person. And that's where Judy Tyler stepped and in. And she was 17 or 18 when she started. Yeah, yeah, and, and, she and I understand both she and Dayton ha Allen had mouths like truck drivers. 
Yes, I was. I'm, the reason I hesitated is because to say that Dayton had a mouth like a truck driver is an understatement. I mean, it didn't matter where he was. I, I happily got to be friends with Dayton. Um, we knew each other very well. He was, he had no filter. He had no filter on the air. He had no filter off the air. Some people might remember Dayton Allen from the Steve Allen show. There was a group called The Man on the Street, and he was the guy that went, why not? And, and let's put it into perspective for some of my viewers and listeners. Dayton Allen was the voice of both Heckle and Jekyll and Deputy Dog for Terry Tunes. Not just Deputy Dog. Every voice on Deputy Dog. Not just oh, that Oh, that's character. right. Vincent Van Gopher and every, the Sheriff everything. and Muskie. You're he right. Did every You're single right. voice yeah. Yeah. on that show. Yeah. He worked for a company then called Terry Tunes, yeah. which again... New York, New York based. New Rochelle, New York. Ah. Right a block and a half from where I lived. I used to walk down there all the time and get the cells. If there was one little mistake on the cell, I got them. You know how rich I'd be today if I had those cells? Yes. You took them out of the trash. I threw them away. Yeah. Anyway. Like um, I collected films. So you had Bill Bill LaCornick, who was Chief Thunderthud. You had Dayton Allen, who did a lot of different characters. You had Bob Keeshan. Uh, So it was all guys, all of them. Well, what happened was, can we get to the massacre? You want to do that? Why don't we save that okay. for uh, the after the break? Okay. Because we want to establish the fact that the show was doing gangbusters. Yeah, this incredible Monday licensing. through Friday. Yeah. Mo- and, and, and at this point, it was Monday through Friday. It was not no longer Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. It was five days a week. Let me ask you this leading into the first commercial. Was it praised by the PTA and by parents in the beginning, or did, did it come under any kind of flack for, for advertising too much uh, commercials and stuff like that? No, it didn't come under any flack for the advertising. It came under flack because kids were yelling and screaming all the time, and it was slapstick, and, and they didn't like that. But Bob's answer to that always was we're not doing the show for adults we're doing the show for kids and the kids love the show and it was i mean the show was beyond anything you could imagine so nbc never complained to them and said cut this out or stop doing this no no, yeah, it no. was a major hit. Okay, yeah. we are at comments at stewshow.com. However, the comment email machine is not working right now. I think it has dropped off from the Internet. Keep writing. Keep sending in your questions for the last segment of the show. Uh, we've got a good audience out there, Bert. We've got over 1,000 people between the listeners and, we and got the viewers. A couple, we have more surprises. We have, we have two big surprises coming up later in the show toward the end. So we hope you'll stick with us. In the meantime, we got to pay some bills here, so we're going to have our first commercial break, and when we come back, we will talk about that 1952 Christmas Eve massacre. Nordame.com continues its passionate love affair with Stu's show and the golden age of entertainment. We invite you to check out our YouTube channel and subscribe. Just visit Nordame.com and click on the YouTube button where you'll enjoy a great selection of movie trailers, old-time radio, and playlists of your favorite novelties from the 1940s through the 1980s. Comedy, drama, and music, it's all here for your viewing and listening pleasure. So from one dame to another, go to Nordame.com. That's N-O-I-R-D-A-M-E dot com. And tell them Janine sent you. You know, my name is Jack LaLanne, and I'm here for one reason and one reason only, to show you how to feel better and look better so you can live longer. Beginning in the 1930s, Popeye the Sailor was a box office champion, more popular than Mickey Mouse, and Betty Boop was the queen of the animated screen. In the 1940s, Superman sent animation soaring to new heights that continue to amaze and inspire. These icons were the product of the great Fleischer Studio and its founder. 
Now, after 40 years, the full story is told in the exciting new book, The Art and Inventions of Max Fleischer, American Animation Pioneer. Author Ray Pointer has penned a documentary in book form that has people talking. The Art and Inventions of Max Fleischer, American Animation Pioneer, available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, McFarland Books, and InkwellImagesInc.com. You're listening to Stu Show at StuShow.com. Do you uh, play anything at all? Well, I, uh, <laughs> the last time I was here, I played the washboard. Good. We'll have you play the washboard again. Just all right, happen fine. to have one right here. Well, look at the washboard. Now, you, uh, you sort of have some fun like that. All right. And, uh, I'll, I'll try to play a little, uh, up you. I'll try to play a little ukulele. <laughs> and how do you think that you and Jerry could sing a little song together? Oh, I sure. Come on, let's, let's be buddies, Jerry, and forget about the marbles. All right, okay, okay good. Let's be buddies. All right, now, now, do you, do you know this song for He's a Jolly Good Fellow, Jerry? Uh, well, sure I do, sure. All right, could, could you sing on this note? Oh. Oh, uh oh. -uh. Oh, down a little. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. No, 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 uh, yeah. no, 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 no. Listen, uh, uh, listen. Oh, oh. Uh, oh, oh. Oh, that's good, that's good. Uh, all right, now, now, Mr. Winslow, will you play the washboard, and, and Mr. Smith, you play the ukulele, okay? All right, I'm ready. So if you're all set, Jerry and Paul and Howdy, let's, let's, let's okay, start. Okay, we're you all go set. Go ahead, fine. You start it, Jerry. Oh, my name is Jerry Mahoney, and Howdy Doody's my crony. But Howdy is such a phony, which nobody can deny. His name is Jerry Mahoney, and Howdy Doody's his crony. But Howdy is such a phony, which nobody can deny. Ha <laughs> ha, good. Jerry, I'll sing. Oh, his name is Jerry Mahoney. His name is Jerry Mahoney. And Jerry's full of baloney, which nobody can deny. Oh, his name is Jerry Mahoney. His name is Jerry Mahoney. And Jerry's full of baloney, which nobody can deny. <laughs> and my name is Howdy Doody. Do 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 And I think that I'm a cutie, which Jerry Mahoney denies. Oh, his name is Howdy Doody. Do 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 and he thinks he's such a cutie, which Jerry Mahoney denies. Good God! Oh, howdy doody's my buddy, a grand and wonderful buddy, and he's an old fuddy duddy, which nobody can deny. Oh, howdy doody's his buddy, a grand and wonderful buddy, but he's an old fuddy duddy, which nobody can deny. Howdy. Oh, I was only fooling. Well, Jerry. I was only fooling. <laughs> For you're a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. Which nobody can deny. What's going, kids? I think they sang very well. I guess they're buddies after all, Paul. Yeah, I see they're getting along fine. Oh, yeah, boy. Get your hand off from me. No, no, that's, that's all right, Howdy. That's, 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 that's all a good thing. Now, let's, let's be nice, nice, cozy fellas now. Okay. Oh, Jerry. Gee, look at his teeth. Why, sure, and where are yours? He got cleaner teeth than I got. <laughs> oh, I use Colgate. No. Like Tuesday and Thursday he, every he day. Way he worked that in. <laughs> <laughs> Every Tuesday and Thursday, got a little plug-in for the sponsor there. That was great. How cool is that? Jerry Mahoney and Paul Winchell with Buffalo Bob and Howdy. How many times did that happen? Not a lot. No, that I was mean, 1949. Yeah, Paul actually did the show. If my, my memory is correct, I think he did it two times. Uh, but that was, you know, based on what we were talking about before, if you look at that closely that was recorded howdy's voice was recorded because they were singing together but i don't think i don't think jerry's was i think paul did now, it live he may have but but howdy was recorded yeah there. yeah right. and and by that point this was a year and a half after they'd gone on the air buffalo bob had that whole acetate thing down yeah and good. we should say too on some of these clips that at this point the motif on howdy was a circus that was the whole idea. It was Wasn't it called Puppet Playhouse when it first Originally started? it was Puppet Playhouse. Then it went to the Howdy Doody, Show, Howdy Doody Circus. It Was was that but, a branding thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, the motif, well, that's why, I mean, how else would you explain a clown and all you know and all this madness? So yeah. it was a circus. Um, and the motif, as I said, 
Red Circus. Eventually, it sort of came, it became a clubhouse once it went to uh, color, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's let's get into the merchandising thing and the reason why Dayton Allen and we should mention Rhoda Man. Explain who Rhoda Man is. Rhoda Man operated Howdy. Uh, she was the puppeteer because she was Howdy's puppeteer. And uh, again, I, I, I was lucky enough to get to know all of these people that we're talking about i knew rhoda very very well um and she was just she was a tough she would say this she was a tough broad that would be a word she would use yeah she in a, in i a, picture her like selma diamond in a, yeah, a little bit a little bit yeah. in a world back then where in a world it wasn't easy then. to do that yeah. it was not yeah. easy to no, do you're that. right they're you right. know women were not looked at that way you think that's why judy tyler was pretty free-flowing with the s- profanity and the smoking and everything behind the scenes i know i think <laughs> judy just had issues i, think she, <laughs> I, you know, I mean I, I mean i spoke to a lot of people that knew judy and she had she had issues. She, had she a dr- was drink. just so damn adorable and so talented. Very quickly, um, before the massacre. So uh, <laughs> Judy uh, was used to go on the road with uh, the Howdy Show when they would go on the road and do personal appearances. And uh, Vic, uh, Bob's brother Vic, who was the sweetest, loveliest man I knew. Was he him. Buffalo Vic? He was Buffalo Vic when he went on the road. He was Buffalo Vic, and he would bring Keisha and Judy and everything. Well, they did a couple of appearances and. Um, on one appearance, they had finished up and they were going to the airport and they were in the airport and Judy was out, out of her princess, you know, attire. And, but some little girl recognized her and said, oh my God, this princess, some of always bring, oh my God. And Judy, I won't say it, just used the worst profanity to this poor little girl. And Vic said at that point, we're not bringing Judy on the road. <laughs> and that was the end of Judy's road appearance. Yeah. So then they, they put like chief feather man in or something like that yeah and that so judy yeah. was was gone from that yeah um i want to ask you i want to ask you before the massacre yes. let's talk about some of the merchandise let's never okay? really talk about the massacre let's just keep saying no 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 the massacre is important right. let me let me grab down into my grab bag here let me show this to the to the viewers okay and you listeners will have to just bear with me this is a castle films eight millimeter film and it's entitled howdy Doody's trip to funland now they did another uh, film for Castle Films called uh, Howdy Doody's Christmas, which is available actually through Shoka's video, along with a handful of Howdy Doody shows. Talk about a plug. yeah. Let me. I want to ask you about this because, um, and I think it was either Chance or Jack Roth who told me that these in our email exchanges these were made specifically for the home movie market. These were not for theatrical or television release. If it had anything to do with film. Jack would be the one to tell you that. Okay, Jack, Jack here Jack, it is. I, I am looking for the sound 16 millimeter version of this, and all I could find was an 8 millimeter silent with the Castle Jack, Films billboards. Jack is the king of film, yeah. uh, so much so that he refuses to take a picture with his phone. So he, even that kind of film, doesn't matter. Does he have a phone? I don't or does know. he have an old Kodak Brownie camera? I, I, I don't know what, I don't know, but he, <laughs> he frowns upon us if we use our phone to take pictures. He does. I'm going to. Pull out my cell phone. No, I don't want to piss Jack off. <laughs> no, we we love Jack. We love yeah. Jack. Uh, um, but love but Jack. anyway, is that is that true that those films were made specifically yeah, yeah. for the home movie? Yeah, market? yeah, that's exactly what. And as I think I told you earlier, in New York they were uh, they were um, sold at a place called Peerless Willoughby. I New bought York. Super Eight cartoons yeah. from them back in the seventies. Yeah, and they were all sold there, and it was it was amazing. I mean, yeah. they sold they merchandised everything, yeah. everything they could merchandise. Yeah. they merchandised. But I think that's really cool that they actually shot film. For the home movie, because usually, you know, I collected films when I was that age, and usually they they treated them like like toys and 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 and, and insignificant toys at that. So it's cool that they actually shot these things that people would only see if they had projectors. And that Howdy Doody's Christmas thing had some production. Right? There was a oh, rocket yeah. ship, and yeah. Mister Bluster was flying in a rocket. Was ship. Was it Dayton Allen that was Santa Absolutely. Claus? Absolutely. Day- Dayton Allen was Santa Claus, and that was Keishan as Clarabelle. Oh wait, wait, it was Keishan as Clarabelle. I don't know if it was Dayton as Santa Claus. Dayton was in another one where he was Ugly Sam because he played a bunch of characters. Ugly Sam was a main. Ugly character. Sam is in that film that's Howdy Doody's Christmas that's, that's yeah. 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 okay yeah. let me let me just show the viewers a couple of things if you want to do further reading on this and I think you will when we get done with the whole history of this this is the book that I read in prep for the show and I'm going to put it right in front of my face Say Kids What Time Is It by Stephen Davis Stephen Davis's dad was the director and then later the writer on the show is that true? a writer on the show a writer on the show, writer on the show. after Eddie Keen had yeah, left yeah, yeah. okay so this is the book this, this book came out in the 80s so you can probably find it used on eBay uh, or at Amazon even, and a lovely picture of Judy Tyler on the back. One of the few, yeah. Yeah, color in shows, color, yeah. in color. So this is the book that I read in prep for the show today, and I highly recommend it, although, Bert, you say it's it's good, but it's not the best that could be. 
No, but it's good. It's yeah. good. Bert is mentioned in it. Yes, I am. Uh, well, most and, of, and and many of Bert's pictures are yeah, in. Yeah, most of the pictures are for me. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then the other one that I want to show is uh, is Buffalo Bob's autobiography, and that's it's awfully thin for mm. an autobiography. Howdy and Me, Buffalo Bob's own story by Buffalo Bob. I, I think there was a hardcover version of that. I think. Okay, this is the only one that I ha- and I've yeah. had these books for these books have been out for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, how's Buffalo Bob's autobiography? Is it is there a lot on Howdy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because, yeah, because, like yeah. I said, it's not very, very thick. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think there was. A, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm forgetting, but I think there was a, a another one. Or a... so, so this leads me to the next question, which is regarding the Christmas Eve massacre. All of this merchandising, all of the popularity of this thing, all of the money that Bob and Martin Stone are making is pissing off the people, or did it just piss off a couple and they started the revolt? Here's what happened. Okay. So, and this is 1952. Th- th- yes, this tells you the intelligence um, and the business savvy of the man that they did not like, whose name was Bob Keeshan. So Bob Keeshan got himself or somebody came to Bob Keeshan as a manager and said, what are you getting paid for this? This show is blowing up. And he, you know, I'm get, they got paid you know, two cents. So he said, well, look, um, I'm going to manage you and I'm going to get you more money. As a matter of fact, what about your other cast members? Dayton Allen, Bill LeCornick, Rhoda Man, etc. What about? And he said, I'll manage all of them. And let's see if we can go in as a group, because we'll, you know, in numbers you're stronger, and get you guys more money. This is the Friends technique 40 years before Friends. Yes. But in this case, <laughs> go ahead. Well, <laughs> NBC slash Roger Muir and Bob sort of called that collective bargaining, which they said was not allowed. And they got very upset by it because, let's face it, on some level they were being bullied. On some level they they were. And so Bob and Roger got together and decided, you know what? The hell with them. We don't need them. So on Christmas Eve, they called everybody in the studio, the whole cast and crew, and they just said out loud, by the way, Dayton, uh, Bill, etc. You know, uh, Only it, Judy didn't go with right, them. Are not going to be with us. Yeah. And they're fired right now. Boom. And they were gone. It's before they even did the show. Gone. gone. I think it was after the show, actually. Gone. That was it. Gone. So, and now they're left with nothing. And, and by the way, no voices, nothing. But they did it. They did it. And then they had auditioned other people. They found a guy named Alan Swift, who at that point was a big voiceover guy. And, and continued to do so for total television yeah, in the and 60s. Yeah, and he was the only one that could come up with bluster the flub-a-dub, the inspector, all of the voices that Dayton did, he was able to duplicate. And they could not, they auditioned until they were green in the face, someone to do dilly-dally. And they could not find anybody, so they had to eat a little crow and call Bill LaCornick and get him back. But Bill, as I read in the book, he wanted to come back because he had realized after this massacre, he made a huge mistake. Well, the reality is they all wanted to come back. I mean, none of them wanted to be there. I mean, they all wanted to come back, but they had to bring Bill back. And no, I mean, Dilly Dally was probably second to Howdy and Bluster. I mean, the one of the better characters. And and LeCornick was a brilliant, brilliant actor. I mean, this is a man that did Chief Thunderthud, a Doctor Singer song, Oil Well Willie. I, I mean, the list went on. I did and the opening And he's the guy who the- announces the episode number at the top. He had this calm, sweet little, you know, almost he, non-masculine voice in real life. Well, he was there, Don Pardo. Really, I mean, yeah. that's really who he was. Yeah. So anytime, that, and he did many characters, especially on the Saturday morning shows. He was terrific. So he stayed, and uh, and Judy stayed. Yeah, and then yeah, but then Judy left. She asked for some time off to go do uh, go to the West Coast. She got married, and she did a movie that everybody's going to know called Jailhouse Rock with Elvis Presley. She was the love interest in that show. If you go back and look at that, you will see. You know, I didn't put the two co- correlations people, together until I read the book. Most people don't. Yeah. And uh, she was driving back from the West Coast to the East Coast. With, with her, her husband, new husband, right? And they were killed in a car accident. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and it was terrible. She was 24? Yeah, terrible. What terrible. a career she would have had. Oh, boy. And, and yeah. I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to in the last few weeks about you know pre- preparing for the show who said they were in the peanut gallery. And even, like you, as a little kid, were just in love with this woman, yeah, this yeah. teenager. It, well, yeah. and, and, you know, Vic used to tell me that um, Bob's brother would always tell me that they could be in a stadium 
with a thousand people and she could get everybody to sing these songs in unison with her. She could control an audience. She just instinctively was terrific. I think alcohol and some other things just oh oh yeah. so you you don't think it was an accident purely an accident i don't know you, yeah i don't know how sad we need to establish bobby nicholson here with the massacre okay, okay. so right. Bo bobby nicholson was bob's one of bob's best friends in buffalo so when they got rid of keishan and he was gone um i heard a story recently that while keishan was still there over a weekend, Bob called Nick, as he called him, and brought him in from Buffalo, and they went in over a weekend and put him in the Clarabelle suit and put the makeup on him and see what he looked like. It all worked fine, and that, that gave them at least comfort when they got rid of everybody. They at least knew they had Clarabelle. So Nicholson came the, down. The interesting this, thing about this, though, is that Nicholson had talent that Keishan did not. Right, and Nicholson, of course, was a musician. He was an arranger. He was a writer. He played the uh, uh, the um, trombone. He was just, he was, that's the kind of guy Bob wanted, Bob Smith wanted around. And, and uh, here's the thing for you game show freaks out there. Uh, this was the formation of Nicholson Muir. Nicholson Muir created the newlywed game. We don't have to go any further than that. They also created pay cards and the, and Mad Libs. Wasn't Mad Libs their creation? I don't know, but let's also say for the people that are saying, wait a minute, they didn't do that. Chuck Barris did that. Chuck, Chuck Barris bought it from Nicholson. He bought Muir. it. I'm yeah. sure when Nicholson and Muir created it, it wasn't raunchy the way it ended up. Being. No, no, yeah, no, it yeah. wasn't at all. So but, that but was anyway, my point. So Nick was doing Clarabelle, so they had him. Um, Alan Swift was doing all the voices. Uh, all the voices. So they were all they were pretty much okay. And look, you know, Lacorna came back. And um, everything was working really, really well. They ended up, now they needed puppet people, though. They didn't have appropriate puppet people. So without going into all the garb, they ended up bringing two of the best back then, Margo and Rufus Rose, husband and wife. And uh, they came in and sort of ran the, the puppet world there and created some wonderful, wonderful uh, characters that they built. Um, uh, Tizzy the Dinosaur, Hop, Skip, and Jump the Kangaroos, um, uh, Captain Scuttlebutt, who was probably my favorite, who, who ran the tugboat. Yes. And, and so the puppets became much more sophisticated. The bodies were better. The movement was better. Everything got better puppet-wise when uh, Margo and Rufus joined. And when Judy Tyler left to do Pipe Dream mm -hmm. on Broadway, yep. that's when they developed or created the Story Princess, right? Yeah, they, they tried a lot of different things. They had the Story Princess. They had another sort of, print, not, not Princess Summer for Winter Spring, but other princesses but nobody as bob used to say to me all the time nobody could match judy she yeah just when, when when in your era of the show toward the end they had peppy mint i think yes who i was a big fan of as a matter of fact she's she, a cutie oh, we're gonna yeah. see her later oh marty <laughs> barris was her name I, and i will is tell she, you this, is she still with us no she passed away uh, a little behind the scenes but bob uh was not fond of marty and it wasn't marty's fault but some executive at nbc sort of shoved marty Peppy Mint down Bob's throat, and he didn't like that, and he took it out on her. She was very, very, very good. She comes off very sweet in the show, and, as yeah, you'll see. Yes, yes, yeah. and quite attractive. Let me ask you about the pre-show warm-up, because Davis in his book goes into this. They always had more kids than they had room for at the peanut gallery in anticipation of, shall we say, behavior issues with the kids. So I want you to tell everybody how they determined who remained in the peanut gallery when they went on the air. Well... Uh, what I remember and what I know is the warm-up was done by Dayton Allen. And again, let's remind everybody, Dayton was out of his mind. Okay? <laughs> now, at NBC, they were doing the show from 3K, Studio 3K. K, by the way, stood for color. We'll get to the color later. Yeah. Uh, um, and they had a window above that the mothers and fathers could look down and see their kids. It's an observation booth. Yes. Yeah. But when the warm-up was going on, there was no audio. And Dayton knew there was no audio because there was no reason for audio at that point. So Dayton knew this. So he would do the warm-up with all the kids. And he would say to all the kids, knowing that the parents were up there watching with no audio, now listen, if every, anybody's got to pick their nose, why don't you all pick your nose now and get it out of your system? And there would be these parents up there all looking at 40 kids, all in unison, picking their nose. This was Dayton's idea of, of, of funny. And they would determine at that point... Who was who would be cooperative? Who would not be cooperative? And all that. And most of the time, most of the time, the the kids stayed there. Most of the time. I have several kinescopes where Bob is trying to talk and the little kids yeah, are interrupting. But him he and, handled it. Yeah, he he, he was it. very good. Unlike the Canadian guy, which we'll talk about. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Bob was <laughs> Bob was surprisingly good with those kids. Those kids. But Bob was a a, a personality in person that was 
bigger than life yeah. itself. Yeah. And, and I, you, know, you know, this is a poor comparison, but when I worked on All in the Family, when I just got in the business as an audience booker, and Norman Lear would introduce Carol O'Connor to the audience, and he came out from the cellar door at the back of the All in the Family set, to see Carol O'Connor in person, his presence yeah. was just amazing. And I get that feel. I know it's bad, but I get that feeling with Buffalo Bob. Oh, no, he was, Bob was bigger than life. And and, and the people that, that knew him, well, my friend Elliot, who's, who's listening, and maybe other people that are, watching and listening when you met but when bob met you when he shook your hand you were the most important person in that room because he made you feel that way he didn't necessarily feel that way but he made you feel that way he was a showman he was a show that's what he was he was a showman he would shake someone's hand and and you kn- he meant it he really meant it. That's who he was. He was huge. This is probably a good reason, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, on why you wanted to mount the Howdy reunions at the colleges during the 70s when you, you brought him back into the public eye because you noticed that, you saw that, and you knew that the kids who are now in college would identify Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't take credit for it. There was a guy who came up with the idea. His name was Bart Seidler, if my memory is correct, and he was the first one to come up with this and book it at the University of Pennsylvania. But you took it and ran with it. I, I took it and ran with it. I was his Bob's road manager. and. Yeah. Um, put put a lot of those shows together and, you know, traveled with Bob all over the country and, and stayed in the same room as Bob. I didn't get my own room, and uh, he flew first class, and I flew, you know, baggage. But yeah, but, still. It was, but it was great. It was, it was great. Well, yeah. we'll get to that in the next yeah. part of the show. Um, Howdy was one of the first shows that they experimented color broadcasting with. First, first show done in Color Daily. First show that around 1955 yeah, it started. Yeah, yeah, most people can't believe, and it was on tape. And yeah. in 1954, first part of 1954, they came out here to christen the NBC Burbank Studios, and they did a week from here in color, right? They, yeah, they NBC wanted to really make a big deal out of the NBC Studios in Burbank, so they they brought what what was the biggest show? Howdy Doody. So they brought Howdy out here. Bob, the whole cast came out, and they did a couple of weeks from here um and we have a clip and i we, want to show it there's a, some kids in the audience are quite well known yeah we probably shouldn't say who will right we'll let them see listen to last names and and look closely and i think you'll see and so let's take a look here's howdy duty in burbank in 1954 at nbc brand new studio well thunder son Tonight's how about a riddle for me oh buddy? cowabunga me want him to sing all right you go ahead buddy and sing it here we go oh, oh. Hi, diddle, diddle, let's tell a riddle, let's tell a funny one. Look at a good one. I begin, and you come in, and we all have a barrel of fun. All right, what do you got, buddy? <laughs> Come on, got me, got a good riddle. Now listen, Ken. Ah, uh, what bell make a noise like a horn? What bell makes a noise? Now wait, 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 wait. Oh, you, you had your hand up first, sonny. Stand up, what's your name? What bell makes a noise like a horn? No help. Well, no hand. Well, let's see. Who else might know? What? That's oh, this little fella. Right. Stand up, Sonny. What kind of a bell makes a noise like a horn? Santa Claus's horn. A whose horn? Santa Claus's horn. Uh, oh, you wake no. up. No. Doesn't anybody know? What kind of a... Wait a minute. Here. What's your name? Yeah, this is Gary Lewis. What kind of a, of a bell makes a noise like a horn? Hey, he's right, Clarabel. Good oh, for you. Let him win. Show him what we oh, got. Oh, look. A look howdy doody that. television game, right? Got him right. Ah, there you are. You're going to have a lot of fun with this. And all your buddies, you and Spike and little Ronnie, have a game a little later, all right? Ah, very, very good. Right. Very, very good. Poor guy. Jerry Lewis's son. And Spike Lee Jr. is in the audience. Spike Jones Jr. So I'm sorry, Sp- Spike. Spike Lee Jr. was not the little no, black right. kid there, but That's Spike right. Jones Jr. And the Playboys were right behind Gary Lewis. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you saw them. How cool is that? But you could see how shy and introverted uh, Gary Lewis sure. as a child was. Sure. Like I said, poor guy. And you know, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I'm going to get that clip, actually, to Jerry. I, I think Because there's no way he has it. I should get it to me. He'll get it to Gary. Yeah, yeah to Gary, not yeah. to Jerry. No, to Jerry to get to Gary. Oh, to Gary. It's oh. easier for me to get it that way. I'll, oh. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they did a couple of weeks out here. We have another clip that we're going to show from that show a little bit late, later on here. Um, so let me see. Let's talk about the licensing of the show to other countries. I find this fascinating because the intricacy in the puppets and the scripts and the creation of this, they did, they did license this program, and there was a Canadian 
Canadian version of this, and wait till you see what you're about to see. Um, that was not Buffalo Bob, though. They didn't have their own Buffalo Bob. I'm going to let you tell everybody the changes that were made for Canada, and you're also going to see the Canadian kids are not as well behaved as American kids, or maybe they didn't have Dayton Allen doing the warm up there to keep them in line. But let's talk about how many other countries and who made the puppets for the well, Canadian version. Well, the Canadian ver the puppets were made at least Howdy was made by the Roses. And uh, and the flub a dub and uh, uh, bluster was there. Um, they they duplicated them. Some of them were from the old days, and they duplicated some of the puppets. How did they happen to duplicate? We call him affectionately the Canadian Howdy. Um, but they, you know, I, I, part of this is certainly my opinion, not fact. But um, I think they got a little hungry and a little. Um, uh, money hungry and weren't watching the store as closely as they should. And when they started to bring the show, they brought it somewhere in South America. Um, there was a Howdy show and in Canada. And it just wasn't done properly. It wasn't done well. It wasn't written as well. Um, <clears throat> there was no Bob Smith, which had a lot to do with that. Yeah, and not even not even a buffalo type character. The as the Canadian one that we're going to show you was Timber Timber Tim, Tom. Yeah, Timber Tom. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean all I can tell you is that it's not very good. Um the a matter of fact the Howdy, are we going to show the clip the uh, Canadian clip? We're going to show the opening in the first commercial cuz they had their own set of sponsors. But we'll so. see Howdy. We'll see Howdy. We will see Howdy and we'll hear Howdy. Yeah, let me tell you that this particular <laughs> Howdy that you're going to see in this episode wasn't even the Canadian Howdy. We're not quite sure where this one came from, but there was one they used uh, that, that Rufus and Margot made that was really beautiful, a beautiful puppet. Something must have happened to that puppet in this particular episode. See, you are so damn good, I can't tell the difference. Oh, now, did God. the ro Roses make the puppets for South America? Oh, yes, 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 okay. yes. So it was a franchise thing that you had to go through oh, them, yeah. and I'm sure NBC had a nice uh, oh, piece of it. Oh, they had to go through NBC and, yeah. and Martin Stone and, and, you know, and Bob. So, uh, All right, well, let's take a look. This is a Canadian version of Howdy Doody from 1955. Get ready to laugh, folks. Hey, kids, what time is it? Hey, Princess, uh, where's our friend Willow, the friendly witch? Uh, I thought the two of you were looking for flub Well, we found Flub, all right. We're well, talking to him right now. Oh, well, There's you know what? Here. You know, flub still wants to learn how to sing, I He's think. He's very determined. <laughs> yeah. There's Flub-a-Dub. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's right over there. Yeah, I see him right over there. I hope Willow can help him. Oh, well. How are you doing? The thing about Willow is you never can be too sure with her because... She's so forgetful. Yes, yeah, she does seem a little confused. Mm. But tell me, Princess, what, what about uh, what about Phineas? Hey, is Willow going to use her magic to help our bluster friend become a clown? Well, wait a minute. Just, 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 you just, please. You just wait. You were all very polite here, Cindy Bowen. You don't interrupt when somebody else is talking. Well, now, Princess, uh... He is next on the list. Phineas is next on the list. Well, you know, Princess, there's one thing that we don't need any magic for, and that's to sing our song. So if you kids in the peanut gallery are all ready... And if all you kids out there in Edmonton, Alberta are ready, and also you kids in Frankfurt, because New Brunswick, and kids everywhere, come on, let's go! <laughs> Well, you certainly can't say there isn't enough activity around Dutyville, but it all makes me kind of thirsty. <laughs> me too, Howdy. I could really enjoy a big glass full of chocolate milk right now. Oh, hurry up, Princess, please. We're thirsty. Already in a moment, Timber Tom, because chocolate milk is practically the easiest thing there is to make the fries way. You just take some nice, smooth chocolate syrup, made with fries cocoa, of course, mm -hmm. because fries cocoa has the very best chocolatey flavor you've ever tasted. Mm -hmm. Add it to a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. Sure? Mm -hmm. And there you are. Oh, thank you, Princess. Mm. Oh, that's delicious. And there's plenty more, Timber Tom. Why, kids, 
You know, mother can easily make enough chocolate syrup from a one-pound can of fried cocoa for 104 glasses of chocolate milk. Toppling timber, 104 glasses? Oh, pour me out another glass, little princess. I haven't even started. Oh, and next time you're thirsty, Peter, try chocolate milk made with fried cocoa. It's really good. Toppling timber. Well, My goodness. And, and boy, oh boy, you know, when we're in Dutyville, we don't interrupt people. Uh, <laughs> in Canada, we do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, whoever was doing Howdy's voice hadn't hit puberty yet. I don't think. So, Maybe I mean, it was me in my previous oh, life. Oh boy, I'll tell you. Well, I don't know how many could tell, but that wasn't. That was a pretty bad Howdy. But um, you mean I, the puppet or the voice or both? Uh, both. <laughs> but you know what? You really can uh, appreciate is you sure can appreciate Bob Smith when you watch something like that. Yeah, but again, in all fairness to them, they they you can't duplicate. You know, it's like somebody else doing Archie Bunker. I keep bringing that up, but, you know, Jackie Gleason maybe could have done it, but not like Carol O'Connor. You couldn't replicate what Bob Smith did for those 13 years on television. No, you could not. Yeah, yeah. No, you could not. Uh, really, really, really interesting stuff. And, again, I want to thank you. This is all from your collection, even though Chance did all the work for me. Yes, yes. Save we'll me. get to Chance later. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think this is probably a good place to take a second break. We're an hour and a half into the show, and we got at least another hour. I hope you all stick with us because we wanted we do want to cover everything, and we've got that, including the afterlife. What? And we have something sitting next to me. That That's what I wanted to ask well, about well, before we go to the break. Well, I'm not going to show. Oh, it you want to do it after the break because because there were actually let's just set this up. There were not just two Howdy Duty marionettes. There was a third Howdy puppet. Right. Yes, there was a photo duty and, and uh, that was not really a uh, a marionette. But let's leave it at that until the other side. Okay. Of the break. So he wants to take the break. So I will push the break button like that and the break is coming up please watch our sponsors they help pay for the show just like the vips do be right back this is jeffrey game show fans the number one and number two syndicated television game shows want to invite you to visit them live and in person that's right, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy are videotaped before live audiences at the Sony Picture Studios in Culver City, California, and you're invited to join in on the fun, absolutely free. Visit WheelJeopardyTickets.com for the latest show and free ticket information. Fill out a short form, press a couple of buttons, print your confirmation, and then voila, we'll see you in person at the taping of your choice. Not only that, but WheelJeopardyTickets.com offers priority seating. That means you're guaranteed admission into the studio provided you confirm your reservations a few days before and arrive on time to take your seats. More details can be found on our website. So visit WheelJeopardyTickets.com and come see your favorite game shows live and in person. That's WheelJeopardyTickets.com. Oh, look, another fascinating selection from the book club. Hey, this isn't from the book club. Indeed, it's not. The official Dick Van Dyke Show book is the definitive biography of TV's most enduring show. It's good. It's darn good. So good, you'll want to share it with all your friends. You might as well know. We read it, we're sorry, we apologize, we loved it. Packed with rare photos and filled with backstage anecdotes, read the book that's garnered praise from critics in all walks of life. I've always found the right to be of the highest caliber. The result of more than 100 interviews with the show's entire cast and crew, the official Dick Van Dyke Show book is the crowning achievement of author and TV historian Vince Waldron. He had any type the whole thing with one hand. The official Dick Van Dyke Show book takes you so close to the show's characters, you'd swear they were reading it right over your shoulder. It had been fairly well mangled. Shh, let me read by myself. Go to DickVanDykeShowBook.com to order your copy today. Hold it. I think you're going to like this picture. Welcome back to the golden days of television. Say, kids, what time is it? Time to beat the clock. It's time for Beanie. Did you say I'll feel better smoking, Philip Morris? Yes, you'll feel better. Coughs due to smoking disappear. Milton Burrow! What made you think it was a lucky strike? Because it was so round, so fine, so fully packed, so free and easy on a draw. <laughs> I really stopped a great career there. Oh, and I'd do it again. I'd much rather be your wife than amount to anything. <laughs> 
That's Shokus Video at www.shokusvideo.com. Classic television on video since 1979. Stu Show is now a proud partner with Patreon. Patreon, where creative artists are supported by donors who appreciate their craft. You can get special rewards every month for helping Stu Showstack continue to produce this weekly program. Become a VIP listener and help keep the legacy of classic television alive. Visit StuShow.com and click on the VIP listeners link at the top of the page for more information. And now, back to Stu's show at StuShow.com. Look, kids, uh, I got... Uh, yeah, hi, hi, Claire, hi, hi. Now, look, I've got another riddle. What do you want? You've got a riddle? Riddle for who? Riddle for me. Kids, Clarabelle's going to stump me with a riddle. I'll tell you what we'll do. If I can guess the right answer, you don't get a prize. If I don't get the right answer, you'll get a prize, okay? Kids, help me now. All right, what's the riddle, Clarabelle? Go ahead. Yeah. Three times three. Four. You mean that's the riddle? Three times... Kids, I know how much three times three is. Four. Three times three is nine. Right, kids? Yeah. Sure it is. Three times three is nine. Yeah. What, right, Clarabelle? Yeah. Three times three is not nine. Well, if three times three is a nine, what is three times three? Uh, ten. Ten. No, kids, it's three times three, ten. No! No, Clarabelle, anybody knows three times three is... You mean you're, you're going to prove it? All right, kids, watch. Clarabelle's going to prove that three times three is... It's ridiculous, Clarabelle. Look, three times three is nine. What are you going to do? You're going to count the three grapefruits three times. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, let me see, kids. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I know that three times three is nine. Show me that it's ten. <laughs> yeah? Oh, kids, he's going to count them three times, so he wants you to count with him. So let's go. Go ahead, Clarabelle. Go ahead. One, One two, three. two, three. What's the matter? Oh, louder? Oh, louder. Uh, peanuts and the coconuts up there. Everybody count. All right, here we go. We'll do it again. Here we go. One, two, three. Is three times three ten? No! Well, but it came out ten. I... There must be a trick. Do it again. Kids, let's watch it this time. We'll count again. I Watch. There must have been another one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Yeah, but yeah, I thought three times three was nine. I, we got to get him a prize. I thought thought we, we need a. Oh, found out me got him prize. Oh, you got a prize for Clarabelle Good. What is it? Got him wonderful prize. Yeah, what is it? Got him diamond clip. Uh, a real diamond clip. Real diamond clip. Genuine diamond clip. Genuine diamond clip. You can give it to your mother, Buffalo Ida. Cowabunga! Here yeah. it is. Yeah. Dime. Yeah. And clip. Diamond clip. Oh, now wait a minute. Now, fellas, I know, no, no, no. no, no, no. Just bring out the seltzer. That's like Abbott and Costello, you know? That's we, a <laughs> Yeah, we should say, too, by the way, that that's uh, they're coming out of the Tonight Show studio, Studio One. At, uh, oh, Burbank. is that where they did it those yeah, two weeks? Yeah, and yeah. that, which which Clarabelle was that? That's that's Nicholson. That's Nick Nicholson. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and he, what happened with him? Why did he, he wanted out because he wanted to talk he on the show. He wanted to talk, right? and then he became all these other characters. And by the way, he ended up doing Bluster, the Flub-A-Dub, the Inspector. What happened to Alan Swift? Went away. After Bob's heart attack and all that, he yeah. went away. And that's what I want to talk about now. Uh, let's refresh everybody's memory on what Bob was doing in addition to a five-day-a-week howdy-doody television broadcast. He was also doing a radio show 
the, uh, uh, the uh, not the Howdy Show, but he was doing a regular radio show. Plus, he was doing a variety show. One he was doing once a week, and then he started to do some of them twice a week. So he was working for all intent and purposes seven days a week. And he uh, thirty seven years old in the fall of nineteen fifty four. He woke up one morning, had these horrendous pains, and they rushed him to the hospital. And he had a massive heart attack. He was not expected to live. No, no. And he was a smoker, too, by the way. He was a smoker. Well, that didn't help. No, it didn't help. So uh, he had the heart attack, and that put him back then pretty much in bed and out of commission for a year before he could get back to doing the show in the studio. So what did they do? Well, they had different hosts. Um, Gabby Hayes came in and hosted because he was on uh, quite often. Um, a, a guy by the name of Ted Brown became Bison Bill. He did it. A gentleman by the name of Ray Forrest did it. Nick Nicholson did it as Mr. Nick. And then the sponsors, not unlike they wanted Howdy to do the commercials, they wanted Bob to do the commercials. So NBC built in Bob's basement a studio, a remote studio, and they called it Pioneer Village. So instead of telling the kids Bob had a heart attack, Bob was on a secret assignment. And they would say, well, let's see him in Pioneer Village. And everyone, Clarabelle would go out there one day, or Chief Thunder, uh, Bill Cornick, and they would do cut-ins from Bob's So house. he eventually got well enough to do the show from his house, but his doctor wouldn't allow him to make that traffic well, drive? He did pieces of the show. He didn't do the whole show. Yeah. He would just be there doing a commercial. It's amazing the technology was good enough then on a live show to do remotes like that. Long Island, how far? Again, I'm not a new show. New show. New show. 45 how, how, minutes. 45 from, minutes? From Manhattan, yeah. Um, somebody posted on your page in anticipation of this show or on somebody's page. It may have been mine. Somebody said that they knew the people who bought Buffalo Bob's New Rochelle house. Uh, I knew them very well. Um, actually, Jill, Sh the uh, girl I went to um, high school with, Jill Schneidman, owned it um, after, bought it from Bob and Mill. There's been other owners, obviously, Made since. the point that the, the, the broadcasting tower was still in the backyard. Well, better than that. Better than that. Milt Neal drew this beautiful mural behind a, like a bar kind of thing of all the characters. Like, I'm talking big, big mural of Clarabelle and Mr. Bluster and Dylan that he did in color, like a like a, a oil painting. It was tell, gorgeous. Tell, tell me it's still there. I believe it's still there. I mean, Whew. hard to know, but I'm sure it's still yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Payne Avenue and Nourish Wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really. Yeah. Um, but this, 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 this was it for Bob. I mean, this from this point on, he gave up everything except Howdy Duty. Yeah, he had to. Um, he gave it up, and and by this point, you got to remember, Bob was the Bob was a big star. Um, he was on, you know, everybody's show. He did the game shows. He did the Perry Como's of the world and the What's My Lines. He and made the rounds, in other words. He did, yeah. and uh, and they traveled the show. They went to Minnesota a lot. Um, they they Bob and and Clarabelle lit the the very famous Rockefeller Center Christmas tree many many years. I mean, he was he was pretty busy. When he came back full time in '55, that's when the show started being broadcast in color every that's day. He came back right at that time. They changed the set. And then he came back, and that show exists, by the way. I um, have it. Yeah. I have it. Um, new, new faces on the show. Yes, I have that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it was a clubhouse. It became a clubhouse. Right. One of the first things he said is, how do you, you, know, how do you like our new set gang? And, and uh, it was a clubhouse. And speaking of clubhouse, 1955, at the same time, Howdy Went Color, a little program on ABC debuted against it called... The Mickey Mouse Club. And... and and, and clobbered the crap out yeah, of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it did, but it, it remained. Um, and let's not forget, Howdy did uh, 2,543 shows on the air for 13 years. And But when Walt Disney came on with that library, that money, that production, it yeah, it started to be Amazing Howdy. that the little network that couldn't, ABC, was able to take down... Howdy Doody, a show that had been on the air eight years at that point and was still favored by people yeah, everywhere. Yeah, I, I think Bob was ready. I think Bob was was uh, ready, uh, you know, to go. I don't think he was... They didn't go. Do you think it was his decision or do you think it was NBC finally looking for an excuse to get Howdy out of daytime and put it on Saturday morning? Yes, yes. They, they Well, it, it didn't... It wasn't rating well enough to be on at 5.30 anymore. And advertising became different. The dollars became better. And Saturday morning would seem to be a better place. So they relegated it to Saturday morning. And and it was a lot easier. I don't think they cut anybody's salary. And they only had to produce one show a week, 30 minutes, not an hour, 30-minute show uh, Saturday. And that's when videotape came in. So they were able to do three or four shows 
a day and take a month off and come back again, right? Yeah, and Bob could play golf, which is what he yeah. loved to do. And uh, yeah, and that's when I saw the show on and, Saturday morning. And, right, and that was the last five years of the show. And yeah. now we come to uh, surprise treat number one. You were able to find a kinescope of the show that little Bert was in the peanut gallery, well, and you can see him. Let me tell you what happened. Yes. So we did a 40th anniversary Howdy Show. Um, when the show turned 40, Roger Muir um, came up with an idea. Bob and Roger asked me to join, and I was one of the people um, that helped put that show together. Um, I was kind of a consultant on it, and I was honored and proud. We're going to show a clip of that, that yeah. later, too. Yeah, but um, what are we going to show? What, we're going to show January 23rd, 1960. So here's what happened. Okay. I was now doing the Sally Jesse Raphael show. We were in Connecticut, and I was doing both at the same time, helping to put together the 40th anniversary and doing Sally. Part of my job, happily, was to find clips for the 40th anniversary show. So I'd get in at like 7 o'clock in the morning to my office in Connecticut where we were doing Sally at the time and just watch these clips, which was I was actually getting paid to do. It was crazy. And one day I'm watching a clip, and I look up and I think, this looks familiar. Wait a minute. That's me in the peanut gallery. That's how I found this this show. So I literally stopped the tape, picked up the phone and called Bob, told him he couldn't believe it because it was sheer coincidence, and I happened to have the clip of me in the peanut gallery. And he brought it for all of us to see. I'm the little guy. In oh, the you'll, I have it marked. Okay. I have it marked. Here's, here's Bert Dubrow in the peanut gallery, 1960. Boys and girls, howdy! Howdy, howdy kids! And howdy, boys, oh, kids, tell me who is this? Peppy Mint. Yes, kids, this is our new little friend, Peppy Mint. She's going to stay with us in Dutyville a long time. That's right. You? Ah, mm -hmm. great. Well, I'm so glad you're here, Peppy. Now, look, while you're here, do you think maybe you could teach me a dance? Do you remember the uh, the Scottish fling that you did sure. for Mr. Surrey? Sure. Uh, sure. How does it go? Well, Bob, just follow me. Yeah, go ahead now. <laughs> this is the. Oh, hi, Clarabelle. Hi. The cow, the cow is over there. Uh, oh, oh you, well, here, do you, you want to watch? Peppy's going to teach me a dance. Just set the pail down. And just, just watch here for me. Now, now, go ahead, Peppy. Well, Buffalo Bob, the first step is a hop skip yeah. like this. Like that, huh? <laughs> now, what's the next step? See, now you do another hop skip yeah. sliding to your left this time. Yeah. Oh, I Now, you try that. that. Yes, silly. Wow. Little Bird in his coat and tie. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a winter day, and that's why the peanut guy was not filled, because some people couldn't get in. Yeah. And I remember walking in that studio and seeing those colors for the first time. I was with my good friend Joel Ferris, who in, lives in uh, Washington, D.C. He was with me that day, uh, and uh, some of the other kids from Trinity School. But it was... Uh, it, it's, uh, how cool is that? When I was a kid out here, I was on Billy Barty's show, and I was at Channel 13 on a show called Bob Atkins and Featherhead. Wait a minute. And I was but, on Chucko the Clown. Hold on. Billy Barty had a show? Billy Barty had a five-day-a-week, hour-long show on KTTV here, and that's where the Three Stooges cartoons in the L.A. market made their debut. He had Larry Moe and <clears throat> Curly Joe come down and sit there, and we got roll gold pretzels, and we got Bonomo Turkish and, taffy, and, and we got all of this great stuff. And we had Officer Joe Bolton Yes, doing York. the Stooges yeah. in New York. Yeah, yes, of yeah. course. But I've had Sonny Fox on the show oh, here, I know and Sonny I've had Mo. Chuck McCann. Uh, so you're not playing with a chimp here, Bert. No, I know I'm not. <laughs> these, these are guys that I grew up yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had our own set of, of, of hosts out yeah, here. Yeah, every, every city um, did. And, yeah. and, but here's my point. All of the stuff that I was on was taped in those days, too. We were a four or five day delay. You've got, and they're all gone. They've all been erased or wiped out. You've got this. I'm very lucky. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, uh, to rem and I remember it, as I say, it was, uh, it's ingrained in my memory. Ingrained in my memory. Yeah. Okay, so a few months after this, less than a year later, the word comes down that NBC is not Reviewing the show. Yeah, now, I want two questions for you. Number one, how did you feel about it when you heard it was going off, and how did Buffalo Bob feel? Well, even though I was 10, I had sort of an inside insider on this thing, so I knew. And I, I knew what was going on. I was still bothering Bob at the liquor store, so I, <laughs> I sort of knew what was going on. I, I, how did I feel about it? I felt terrible about it. And I remember sitting and watching the last show, um... And and for the people that might not remember, the last show was a special hour program, 
And the whole, it began with uh, Clarabo saying he had a surprise. And all through the hour, he built surprise, surprise, surprise. Last we we have the clip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then people will see it. But it was pretty, it was a sad day. It was a sad day in television. But listen, everything must end. And it ended. And Bob, as he would tell the story, watched it. It was a taped show. So he watched it with his family. And uh, he went out right after that and played the worst game of golf he ever played in his life. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But he was he was rich and he was content and he had his liquor store. So financially, he was set. Yeah. But how could it not bring a tear to your eye? You right. Know? No, it was... It was yeah. uh, and as you'll uh, see right now, uh, if you're not in tears at the end of this, what you're about to see, uh, you're not a caring, feeling person. Watch this. The last few minutes of the last show. Well, you know, boys and girls, we're just about ready to close up Duty Bell and Lee. But now, kids, before we do, howdy, Clarabelle, Mr. Cobb, and I, the whole gang, would like to thank all of you boys and girls of all ages for watching our shows these many, many wonderful 13 years. Kids, you've been wonderful. And so, so long, and perhaps someday we'll come your way and you'll hear us again say, howdy do. Right, Howdy? There's no more show. That's right. It's time to go. Time to go. Goodbye, Goodbye. From, from us, us to, you. to you. Well, so well. long, Corny. So long. Good luck, kids. See you around the corner. All right, buddy. Okay, Good well. luck. Bye, Corny. Well, Clarabelle, kids, tell me, are you ready for the big surprise? <laughs> you are. All right, Clarabelle, tell me now. What is the surprise? Please, quick, what is it? You mean, you can talk? Oh, why, golly, I I don't believe it. You can talk. Well, Clarabelle, this is your last chance. Now, Clarabelle, if you can talk, prove it. Let's, let's hear you say something. Now, are you? I'm in tears. I'm in absolute tears. Every I've seen this a hundred times, and it's and you are too. Well, it's it's sad to watch it. It's sad to watch it. But again, everything uh, everything must end, and uh, it ended. To watch for me, to watch Lou Anderson, who who was Clarabelle, who was one of my favorite people in the whole world. And what a kind, gentle voice oh, he had. The sweetest, sweetest. There was not a mean bone in that man's body. Just having the conversation with his wife yesterday about it, and he was just. I'm glad his wife is still with us. Oh yeah, oh god, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, give us a. We got lots of surprises still left, and that's not the end of the Howdy Duty story. But we have a another surprise. Bert so, brought something else with. So him. Bob used to bring photo duty around with him to take pictures and do publicity because if you brought the marionette, you'd have to. It had strings, and you have to have a puppeteer. It was a whole crazy thing. So there was one photo duty from way 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 back that ended up being sold in an auction this one is the last one that was used and um and there it is and bring here, it into the day i look here, at this here is our friend there he is there is give him two seconds of Take about how yes. there, there, there he is, and, uh, <laughs> Mr. Dubrow. <laughs> there, there he is. So that um, he sits in my house, and I, I proudly have him, and uh, he celebrated the fiftieth, seventieth. Uh, Fiftieth with Bob. Oh, the fiftieth yeah. with Bob, which we have a clip of yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we got so much more. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, mm. this is sort of a treat for to be able to see uh, to see photo, and I'm gonna lift him up and show you because he's got the coolest boots yeah. in the world. The yeah. coolest boots in the world. But anyway, that is. Uh, that's and that him. that is from the fifties, right? No, no, this one's not from the fifties. Oh, from, this is from later. This okay. is from later. But just to see that, look at he has that sort of dazed, glazed look about him. Which I, I I've always, which I've always loved. That's because I lived through the seventies, Mr. Dubrow. <laughs> speaking speaking of the seventies, that's not the end of that. What you just saw was not the end of the Howdy Doody story. There's lots more ahead. Stay with us. We'll take another break. We will take another break if the thing behaves. It behaved. <laughs> we'll take another break and we'll have post Howdy Doody stuff for you when we return. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Shelley Berman. He's been entertaining people for over 50 years on stage, in movies, on television, and on his classic million-selling comedy albums. 
Now, Grammy Award winner and Emmy Award nominee Shelley Berman presents his first book of poetry, To Laughter with Questions, Poetry by Shelley Berman. In the introduction written by Shelley, you'll read about his inspirations for the more than 40 poems contained in this collection. I loved being chosen to be in the cast of the great comedy series Curb Your Enthusiasm. I could not resist writing about my excitement at having a very good part in that show. And, in addition to poems inspired by personal experience, Shelley writes about things that affect all of us. Some sounds seem almost designed to drive one mad, such as the incessant beeping of construction vehicles. To Laughter with Questions, poetry by Shelley Berman. For more information, please visit the official Shelley Berman website at ShelleyBerman.com. It's time to visit JackLaLanes.com. Celebrate the life and career of the man who left a legacy of health, beauty, and fitness tips that are just as valuable today as they were when Jack was seen daily on television. Jack's last book, Live Young Forever, has been critically acclaimed and is one of his best. It contains a full overview of Jack's life and how he lived it. And there are never-before-seen photos as well as tips on juicing. While working out, quench your thirst with a brand new official Jack LaLanne stainless steel water bottle, available in three different colors. It holds 20 ounces of your favorite fitness beverage and is perfect for the gym, work, or home. Each bottle has a different LaLanneism inscribed right on it, like 10 seconds on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. Plus, it makes an excellent gift. Visit JackLaLanne.com to view these and many other fine products for your health, fitness, and beauty. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. That's JackLaLanne.com. Oh, look, another fascinating selection from the book club. Hey, this isn't from the book club. Indeed, it's not. The official Dick Van Dyke Show book is the definitive biography of TV's most enduring show. It's good. It's darn good. So good, you'll want to share it with all your friends. You might as well know. We read it, we're sorry, we apologize, we loved it. Packed with rare photos and filled with backstage anecdotes, read the book that's garnered praise from critics in all walks of life. I've always found the right one to be of the highest caliber. The result of more than 100 interviews with the show's entire cast and crew, the official Dick Van Dyke Show book is the crowning achievement of author and TV historian Vince Waldron. The idiot, he typed the whole thing with one hand. The official Dick Van Dyke Show book takes you so close to the show's characters, you'd swear they were reading it right over your shoulder. It had been fairly well mangled. Shh, let me read by myself. Go to DickVanDykeShowBook.com to order your copy today. We now return to Stu's show at stewshow.com. <laughs> You're the funniest clown I've ever seen in my life. I want to sign you up for my show, Clarabelle. Oh, you're so funny. You just sign right on the bottom line here, young man, and you'll be treated right. Sign right on the bottom. Clarabelle, that's what I put down there. Hey, oh, boy. No, oh, Clarabelle, right. don't sign that contract. Don't tear me. If you contract. sign that contract, you know what it means? You're going to have to leave Dutyville. You'll never sign it, torn or not torn. Oh, don't now, it. don't sign this contract. You'll be leaving all your friends. Oh, uh, just... The cotton picking minute. Oh. You sign this, Claire Bell. You sign it. <laughs> and you only have to work in the show. I sign it. And then the rest of the time you can ride on all the rides. Three. What's the matter with Buffalo Bill over there? Sign it while he's laughing. Oh. Don't sign it. Sign that. It's all the Sign it. Quadruplicate. He signed it. He signed it. Let me see what I said. What you were laughing. No, there's no sense in looking at it. He's a working for me now. Go there. All right, buddy, you're leaving. I'm crying. You'll be leaving all your friends. Yeah, yeah he thinks you're funny too, Claire Bell. <laughs> Live show, just like we're doing here, mistakes and all. Oh. Boy, when Bob Smith cracked up, he didn't mess around. Oh, he was just, well. First of all, Nick, who was his best friend, that was Nicholson. He, he was hysterical. He would his goal in life was to break Bob. Up. Well, he did. He called him Buffalo Bill. But, oh yeah, <laughs> which is what Bob hated. He hated but because people would always say, "Aren't you Buffalo Bill?" Yeah. Bob would say, "No, it's Buffalo Bob." Yeah. And yeah. Nick did it on purpose. Yeah. On yeah. Purpose. yeah. Yeah. But you got to watch really carefully. What made Bob crack up was well when the when he ran in. 
and the contract ripped. I mean, everything went wrong. The moment the contract <laughs> ripped, it went on the floor. There was nothing he could do. Everything was just falling apart. It's yeah. hysterical. I it's know. you know, it's live I, television. That's why I love doing I know, this show I, live because with all the screw ups and everything, it just makes no, it more natural. That's, that's right. everything is so damn overproduced today on television. I even know. what are supposed to be spontaneous game shows, it looks like they're all planned and terrible. And you never did any of that. In what you saw on Sally Jesse Raphael was the real deal. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I, and Jerry. I mean, and Jerry. Oh, even yeah. though I'm not a big fan yeah, of that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. No. Yeah. But it was all. It when I did it, even the madness and the craziness on Jerry, it was real. Yeah. I mean these. And, I mean, and your segment producers never prompted them and told them what to do or anything. Well, you didn't have to. I mean, <laughs> I mean, look at those people. I mean. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, they, they were who they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's let's not veer off topic because no, no. you, you're going to get me all. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. I don't, calm down, Stu. <laughs> I don't want you to get upset at all. Just Let me ask you now. We're going to yes. do we're going to do one more let's, segment on the history of the show, and then we'll hear from the viewers, and then we're done. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the '60s. Howdy was pretty dormant during the '60s, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Bob moved to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, played golf. Lived a, a very relaxing life. Married to his. High school sweetheart uh, Mildred Smith, as he called her, Buffalo Mill. Um, <laughs> three boys, um, and uh, Chris, Robin, and Ronnie uh, were grown, grown, grown. And uh, I, I know the three of them; they're great. Um, but yeah, he was quiet. Everything was fine. Um, had no thoughts of really going back. And then one day, gets a phone call from a guy at the University of Pennsylvania, Bart Seidler. Who said nostalgia was very big? And I, I, so when I was discovering the Marx Brothers as a young teenager, and I'd always loved the Three Stooges and Laurel and Hardy, and this was and this is when I started to really love classic television. I was in my early teens. Yeah. So this was the time. And Go this ahead. is Vietnam War time and all that. Yeah. And uh, nostalgia became very big. People were looking to find a smile somewhere. Um, not a whole lot different than today on some level. Uh, but anyway, uh, this guy called and said, "We're doing a, a nostalgia night." at uh, the U University of Pennsylvania, would you come, Buffalo Bob, would you come? He said, well, w what would you want me to do? And he said, well, do you still have uh, the Buffalo suit? And uh, Bob said, yeah, I, still, I think I can still get in it. Uh, have you got a kinescope, a film of the show? Bob said, yeah. He said, I've got the uh, 10th anniversary show from 1957. So he went without knowing much of anything to the U University of Pennsylvania that night. I think the auditorium seated... Uh, 1,500 people, something like 3,500 people showed up to see Buffalo oh, Bob. My. But it was like seeing a ghost. You, he, where was he? And this was our first father image. This was a person we loved and grew up with. He was our guy, you know. And uh, he went back to Florida after that, was playing golf, um, was with a, a publicist by the name of Jack Drury, who he used to play golf with. He told Jack about it. And he said, you want to go back to work? And Bob said, what do you mean? He said, we can buy them. We can book colleges all over the country. They've got money. So Bob went, began to do that. I got wind. I was in Boston at school. I got wind of it. Um, I called him up. Um, I'm sure it was a nightmare for him to hear from me again. And uh, <laughs> he said, look, let's have dinner together before the show. And just like when I was 10, we sat and had dinner. And here was the guy in regular clothes and glasses, glasses and... We had dinner, and then he said, look, I, want, I really want you to see the show, Bert. So I walked into this auditorium that was about 1,500 people. It opened with the film of the 10th anniversary, black and white, all the commercials, Hostess Cupcakes, Hostess Twinkies, Wonder Bread. Everybody went nuts. I think everybody in the audience was high. I, th I mean, you could you could get a toke of marijuana just walking in. I mean, it was, that, it was the times. And uh, anyway, and then all of a sudden, you're watching this big black and white film that you hadn't seen Howdy or Bob in a long time, and then boom. Out comes Buffalo Bob. It was in, I, I can't tell you. Now, I just had dinner with the man, but not that man. I had dinner with guy with the glasses and the re regular shirt. Then out comes this man, and for an hour and a half, he had that audience in the palm of his hand by himself. Nobody with him, just he and a piano. That's all he needed. And he told stories and answered questions and sang all the songs, and it was unbelievable. I got hooked, and I called Vic, his brother. I said, he needs me on the road. He's going to get too tired, and if he doesn't have me on the road, he'll have another heart attack and die. And he called Bob. Bob called me. I was on the road with him. That's amazing. Um, you, you wanted to be a part of this. He, 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 he didn't really need you. You wanted to be a part of it. Right. He, but, yeah. but as we did it, I think he did need oh, me. Oh, there was no question yeah. that once you got in there, yeah. he needed you yeah. Yeah. as yeah. much as you and needed him. I emceed all the shows. I put them together. And we were on the road for a couple of years. I've got a great clip that Chance provided, of, and it's a, several clips put together. But this was sort of the frenzy 
that took place when Bob and and this is you introducing him, right? This is, I don't think so. It's, it's think not I'm, you. Well, well, we'll run the clip and no. then we'll talk. But Bob had to modernize his jokes for oh, that which audience, can, which we can which, talk about which, on the end. This is yeah, some, yeah, yeah. This is something that uh, that actually Chance had. Jack Roth gave it to him, and here it is. Yeah, this is this is great stuff. But you'll you'll see what I mean about about um, Bob modernizing the show a little bit for the 1970s audiences. This is uh, Princeton University, 1971. All right, after 11 years, the man that every little boy idolized and every little girl wanted to marry, a tremendous welcome for Buffalo Bob Smith! <laughs> hey! Look at these kids! Oh, ho, ho, ho! Look at the gallery! And I say, St. Kids, what time is it? Okay, let's go! It's howdy duty time. It's howdy duty time. Bob Smith and howdy do. Say howdy do to you. Let's give a rousing cheer. Cause howdy duty's here. It's time to start the show. So kids, let's... Oh, what a gallery. I got a clap for you. Thank you very much. You know, I... I, uh... I, I asked them if they'd tune the piano. <laughs> and I... Oh, that Clarabelle, you never know where he'll hide his rolling papers. Now look at this. Here he's got them in the piano. Is that silly? Oh, that dumb... Well, I, um... Uh... Clarabelle's a pothead. I love it. I, I love it. You know, I watch that now. And, and that was you. Yeah, that was me. Introducing that, yeah, him. That was me introducing him. Yeah, but um, that was my voice. But to see that again and really watch it... Uh, it's hard for me to put into words being in a room like that every night, whether it be Maryland or whether it be Syracuse or wherever it was, it didn't matter. That reception was big and bigger than that. And what we would do on the road, we started with that one line, you know, Clarabelle, you never know where he's going to hide his rolling papers. And then we would come up with other things that would just, you know, keep it to the times. And it was just, oh my God. Never needed Clarabelle or Chief Thunderthud. He did a one-man show. One-man show. Wow. One did man. he take questions from the audience? A lot of questions from the audience. And um, we, we ended up putting together a Howdy Trivia contest. We pe People with horns, they to get the answer. It was just... It, it he was must fun. have been on cloud nine. He's playing to adults now and not little kids. Well, he didn't really know, really, the impact Howdy had on all of us until years later when he got to the colleges. And yeah. when I say that, I mean, you would see kids, I use the word, with long hair. I mean, guys with long hair. And that, that were, we would say, you know, little freaks that would go over to Bob and say, can I hug you, Buffalo Bob? Thank you. You were my first father image. I really appreciate what you did. And it was like he couldn't believe it. He yeah. couldn't believe it. Was I'm amazing. having a hard time believing yeah, it now because I know exactly what you're saying. It was amazing. It, it really was. Yeah. Now, this, this leads, sadly, to something you're not too happy with, and that is the Revival Series of 1976. This, I believe, Metro Media syndicated this. Right. And I have always had a theory. I don't remember it, this show playing in the L.A. market. What I do remember is around January of 75, when I first started giving out tickets to TV shows, that KTTV bought the reruns to the original Mickey Mouse Club and they were through the roof at least for the first year locally here and maybe do you think that's what gave Bob the idea to revive Howdy in first run syndication no well, the, the, you just saw the idea the college revival is what gave her, and, and you got to understand, all over the country, there was sort of howdy duty mania. NBC reissued merchandising. There was merchandising back out there. So it was sort of a, a, a natural thing to do. Now, nobody's fault here, and it's always easy to, to, you know, to say something after the fact. But for me, the appeal of the howdy show was an intimacy. Howdy was talking, or Bob was talking to me. He wasn't talking to a million people. Let's run the clip. I have a clip, and I know you're not going to like it because you're not a fan of this. Let's run the clip, and then we can expound on that a little bit. Oh, is that all right with you? Sure. Okay, so this is a, this is a Howdy Doody, just a, a, a couple of minutes from the Howdy Doody revival that aired in the fall of 1976. Can I say something? Well, let's run the clip first. Here he is. 
Buffalo Bob Smith. Kids, moms and dads, what time is it? Okay, gang, let's go! It's Harley Duty time. It's Harley Duty time. Bob Smith and Harley Doo. Say Harley Doo to you. He's on Harley Doo. On Harley Doo, he's here. It's time. Oh, well, hi, howdy. Oh, oh, well, hi, Buffalo Bob, and hi, Peanuts. Hi, howdy. Well, you know, Peanuts, this is Dutyville's 100th birthday, and we're celebrating it with a big Dutyville fair. Well, it, now, it hasn't been going too well because, well, actually, there's, there's nobody to supervise it. Yeah, you're right, howdy. You see, I can't possibly be the manager of the fair because, well, I'm in charge of the entertainment. But, Peanuts, we've sent away for an experienced fair manager, and he should be arriving here any second. Yeah, and his name is Carnival Cat. Right. Say, Buffalo Bob, yeah, have... it's deserted backstage. There's nobody around. Uh -huh. well, where is everyone? Well, I'll tell you what they're doing. Everyone is out in the parking lot, and they're waiting for Carney Cal to arrive. You see, Happy, for years, Carney Cal has been a very successful manager of carnivals and fairs. That's right, and he must be very wealthy, too. Oh, boy, yeah. yes. As a matter of fact, uh, we expect him to arrive here in a big limousine with a chauffeur. Oh, a limousine. Wow. Yes, sir. That's great. <laughs> so. What's that? Well, Did what you hear it? it? Sounded like a bell. Bicycle. Hello. What? Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. Don't you remember me? What? Carney Cow. Carney Cow. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you, Carney. Yeah, that's that Weird Al Yankovic's first appearance on television. There. Um, okay, you were gonna say you were gonna say before we went into the uh, the segment. Please yeah, don't yeah. turn off. It I was gonna say don't turn off. Don't judge. <laughs> don't judge Judge Stu's show based on that. Please. Well, we have to show it because it's part of the history. Uh, no, but of course. Howdy's hair. Okay. Well, let's hold on. Yeah. Let us stop for a moment. <laughs> all of all of you, and let's talk. Um, <laughs> now he's talking to you as a producer so now, as no, an no, Emmy no. winning no, talk show I'm producer. I'm not. I'm talking as a viewer, really. Okay. But right. here's the point. Howdy was a very intimate show. It it it, it was a one on one with the person at home for all of us. Now, in fairness to them, they thought instead of trying to appeal to kids that are six years old, let's try to appeal to kids that are six and 106. Because but putting the parents I, in the I audience that, wrong. I, well, it, it listen. Obviously wrong. It didn't work. And then I was very involved with the making of that puppet. Now, I said, pleaded with Bob and Roger Muir, don't make another puppet. Use the old puppets. And all I heard back, no, those are ancient. And, uh, and they wouldn't listen to me. And they, But they, I was able to have them hire a gentleman by the name of Paul Ashley for people in New York will know that he was Chuck, he worked very closely with Chuck McCann. That's did, where I heard the yeah, name. Yeah, did all the puppets for Chuck. He did the Laurel and Hardys for That's Chuck. Right. He did all of the puppets that Chuck uses, every one of them. He was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, artist. Brilliant. Anyway, um, he made the puppet. He only made what he was asked to make. So what you saw, there was no reason for hair and all that. I will say this. Bob, when it was all over, finally admitted to me, okay, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't have used those puppets, etc. But it was too late, and it never went anywhere. Were you at any of the tapings? I was not, happily. I was not. No, <laughs> that was in Florida. That was done in Florida. Yeah, yeah. But seeing the parents in there, and the parents are singing more than the kids. If well, you take a look at that, watch the thing again on YouTube after I post it, and watch the kids. They're not having or, a good or, time. Or, or don't watch it if you don't yeah. want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but watch, watch the kids in there because they're not having a good time. No. No, neither was I watching it just now. I mean, it spoiled. It, it, it was terrible. Lou used to come, on, come from, you know, back from Florida, and we used to talk about it. Yeah. And, and they all knew, and they, they, they tried to make it like laugh in with quick cuts and yeah. it just yeah. That's it, not what Howdy Doody was all about. No. Although, in fairness to them, I don't think they could have done the original Howdy Doody show in the 70s right. either. I think you're we right. We tried to do that with yeah. Lucy in the 80s, yeah. and we bombed. I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. So, you know, people, right. things happen. So we, now we'll skip ahead 12 years. It's the 40th anniversary. Now, you mentioned 
mentioned briefly that you were involved with the 40th. How could how could you not be involved with this after you knew them so well? How did this all come about? How did they sell this and syndicate this as a two-hour special in 1987? Well, I had an idea. I, I, I thought it was a big deal that it was the 40th anniversary. I wanted them to do a black tie event in a theater and, and make it like an award show. But, you know, write it and make it funny and all that with Howdy Doody up on stage and everybody in tuxedos in the audience. I thought it would have been funny to do it as a fun thing. Uh, I'm the only one that thought that. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Muir didn't think so. Yeah. So he sold it. And I can't think of the name of the company now. Um, it wasn't Metro Media, was no. it? Because it aired on Metro Media here. No, it was not. Um, it, uh, I, I'll think of it. But the anyway, syndicator you're talking it, about. Yeah. Yeah. He's, and they produced it. This company produced it. They wrote a script. Bob called me and said, I need you to get involved. I said, I'm, I'm here. Whatever you need and me to do. And that was done out here. Yeah. The uh, Herb Alpert Studios. There. A&M on, yeah. a on La Brea, the old yeah. Chaplin Studios. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So anyway, we got the script, and it was horrible. Horrible. And uh, it just it was bad. And I said to Bob, let me mark it. Let me go through it. And he, he let me, although he didn't have final say, the p people that Roger hired. What happened to the original writers? Roger didn't want to use Eddie Keene or those other guys? No. Why the hell not? I, uh, why? For the same reason there were mothers and fathers in the audience in the 70s show. That, that's why. Uh, did, did Bob d defer to Roger a lot? I mean, did, did he just trust Roger's instincts? I, I, I say he deferred to Roger. Whether he trusted his instincts, I, I, it's another thing. He deferred to Roger. Um, Bob was very good at criticizing people after the fact. <laughs> he, didn't, he, he didn't necessarily have a vision, yeah. but he was very good at criticizing after the yeah, thing. Yeah. But anyway... Um, what did you think then overall? What, how, so the script came back and it was worse. Uh, were you able to doctor it at all or do we anything? doctored it a little bit, but, you know, I mean, Monty Hall was on, Gary Coleman. Uh, they were trying to keep it current. Marianne Mobley and Gary Collins. Nothing wrong with these people, but it didn't, they didn't belong there. No, what it should have been was retrospective. And there were a lot of clips, but there was too much... I, for lack of a better word, schmutz, uh, schmutz around the clips. And too much story. I mean, it was yeah. just, it didn't work. But anyway. Anyway, um, we have a clip of the ending, which you, you should be damn proud of. Well, nothing else of this ending. Here's what happened. Right. Bob and I were flying out to California together. Uh, I forget where we were, but we're flying out to do this special. And I was so frustrated. On the plane, I sat down without even thinking about it and wanted to come up with a close to help close this show. At least the words that came out of Bob's mouth would be correct. And so I wrote this thing on a yellow pad. I think I wrote it in 10, 15 minutes. Bob and I were sitting together. I said, Bob, do me a favor. Read this. And he read it. And he looked at me and said, this is terrific. I said, we got to put this in the closing of the show. So he said, okay, we have to. We got there, we're talking to the producer, the writer, and I was standing there. And Bob said, I want to do blah, 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 blah. And the guy said, well, I don't think we're going to, I'm not sure we have to, room for that. And Bob said, if we don't have room for that, we don't have room for me. Just like that. And Ooh, run it. Him, and so it was oh, yeah. Thank you. When the music, <laughs> so everybody knows, when the music sort of stops and Bob looks into the camera with the intimacy that I have been talking about, this is what I wrote. All right. Here it is. Howdy Doody's 40th anniversary special, written by Bert Dubrow, at least the ending of it. 1987. I want all of our alumni to know just how proud we are of all of you. And you know, as you peanuts grew up, you stood up for what you believed in. And we're all in better shape because of you. And I just like to think that Howdy and I had a little something to do with the way you turned out. And say, you little peanuts, you please listen to your moms and dads. Because you know, I knew them before you did. And just please trust me when I say that everything they say to you comes from just one word. Love. It's time. Just beautiful. That is a proud moment in the career of Bert Dubrow. Yeah, no, I, I, I watch. I haven't watched it in a long time. Yeah, it was, um, it was wonderful, and and it just it fit properly. And you will notice 
that there were none of those new puppets there. It was the old yeah. puppets, yeah. which the, the puppeteers that had to do that show were so angry at me because they had, I, I called the Roses, I called Roger actually, and then we called Rufus and Margo, and I said, we got to use those puppets. We can't use anything but those, and we did. And uh, Overall, were you were you okay with the special, even though you had no say over the whole thing, or are you? I was okay. I, it was I, certainly I, better than the 76 revival. Yeah, but yeah. Cl- close. Yeah. But yeah. All right. That is, believe it or not, that's not the end of the Howdy Doody story. We got something else to talk about after this last break, and we're going to hear from you via email. This is your last chance to get emails in. Comments, C O M M E N T S, at stewshow.com. We'll put a button on this whole thing and hear from all of you right after we take our last commercial break. And that goes like this. Hi, everyone. Ed Robertson of TV Confidential with a special offer to listeners of Stu Show who are fans of James Garner and fans of classic TV in general. My book, Maverick, Legend of the West, is now completely revised with more than 100 pages of new information about the classic TV Western series that made James Garner a star. Autographed editions of Maverick, Legend of the West, are now available exclusively through Maverick, Legend of the West, Dot com. Plus, if you are a listener to Stu's show, type in the promo code Stu, S-T-U, right above the Buy Now button at MaverickLegendOfTheWest.com. I will send you a CD of our complete two-part interview with John Winnegar about James Garner absolutely free. But you have to type in the promo code Stu, S-T-U, to get that free gift. More information, check out MaverickLegendOfTheWest.com www.maverick.legendofthewest.com This is Jeopardy! Game show fans, the number one and number two syndicated television game shows want to invite you to visit them live and in person. That's right, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy are videotaped before live audiences at the Sony Picture Studios in Culver City, California, and you're invited to join in on the fun, absolutely free. Visit WheelJeopardyTickets.com for the latest show and free ticket information. Fill out a short form, press a couple of buttons, print your confirmation, and then voila! We'll see you in person at the taping of your choice. Not only that, but WheelJeopardyTickets.com offers priority seating. That means you're guaranteed admission into the studio provided you confirm your reservations a few days before and arrive on time to take your seats. More details can be found on our website. So visit WheelJeopardyTickets.com and come see your favorite game shows live and in person. That's WheelJeopardyTickets.com. Wardame.com continues its passionate love affair with Stu's show and the golden age of entertainment. We invite you to check out our YouTube channel and subscribe. Just visit Noirdame.com and click on the YouTube button, where you'll enjoy a great selection of movie trailers, old-time radio, and playlists of your favorite novelties from the 1940s through the 1980s. Comedy, drama, and music, it's all here for your viewing and listening pleasure. So from one dame to another, go to Noirdame.com. That's N-O-I-R-D-A-M-E dot com. And tell them Janine sent you. Once again, here's your host, Stu Shostak. Would be me. Thank you very much. Recording of video recording of Randy West. I can say video recording of Randy West. Randy West. My favorite. I love Randy. Hello, Randy. You just got a plug from one of the greatest talk show producers on the love, face of this. Love Randy, my my brother from another mother, as they say. Uh, oh, really? Yes. That's that's another that's another show we yes, can do. Yes. I'm s- trying to switch and host at the same time, and it's not easy. Um, but may I say you're doing a wonderful job? Oh, thank you so much. Could I give myself two seconds of applause? Um, do, do it again. Okay. 
He deserves it. See, I do whatever he asks me to do because he's my fearless leader. Um, 1975 or so, Happy Days did an episode with Buffalo Bob. Janine wanted me to ask the expert about that. How do you think they did? That was not Lou Anderson as Clarabelle. That was Bob Bruner, one of the writers on the show at the time. Mark Rothman, if you're watching, send me an email and confirm that. But what did you think of that episode? What did Bob think of it? Well, I can confirm it, actually. It was it was uh, Bob Bruner. And yeah. I think when we're together, hopefully with Brian Levant, when we, we do that, we'll confirm all of this. But um, here's what I know. Um, Bob Bruner wanted yeah. to be Clarabelle and wrote an episode. And they gave it to Bob. It got to Bob. He actually sent it to me first. And my first reaction was, this is great, but you got to use Lou. You got to use Lou Anderson. And he said, look, I said the same thing, but this guy wants to do it. How do I not do the show? I said, you're right. So we told Lou. Um, what did I think of it? I thought it was fine. Um, was it Richie was going to expose Clarabelle for... Uh, for the newspaper, for the school newspaper. Yeah. And um, I, I have to say that I thought with those kinds of budgets, they could have done a much better job mocking up the, the Peanut Gallery and Dutyville and all that. They, I believe all, that was an episode that they did prior to having the live audience. You there. are right about yeah, that. Single but even camera. so, but they yeah. still could have made yeah. it. Yeah, they could have. They could have spent more money because they didn't have the, the burden of the audience yes. and, and being confined to the four walls. And that was the real howdy that they used, uh, yeah. the one that's now yeah. in the Detroit Institute. But um, yeah, I thought it was... Uh, Okay, and Bob uh, Bob really loved it. All right. He loved we it. have a couple of quickie things to talk about to wrap up the history of Howdy, and then we'll go to the emails. And Bert's really excited. He loves emails. He loves hearing from you, as do I. And everybody's loving this. I can tell you that oh, right good. now. Good. Everybody's loving this. Um, after the 40th anniversary, Howdy was dormant again for a little while. And then in 1998, for the 40th, 50th anniversary Right, am I right about that? The fiftieth anniversary. Um, did Bob make a licensing agreement with with certain toy companies? Because I know that the, uh, NBC licensed a bunch of Howdy Doody shows to be out on VHS at the time. This was before DVD, and and Bob went on QVC to hawk all of these fifty anniversary. What's yeah. the history well, here? It, well, NBC wanted to do it, and uh, Bob always ha had some arrangement because they owned Howdy. They, when he sold it, they owned Howdy, but they did not own Buffalo Bob. And that was there was always that distinction. So, yes, he went on QVC. So they which, worked together with this thing. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's all I want to say. This is, except, because we have a surprise, there's a surprise in this that you're going to see. We want to say that, that this was the last time that Buffalo Bob appeared nationwide on television. Yeah. Bob was, uh, Bob was diagnosed with bone cancer after that. Um, I talked to him. A little bit after that, had my last conversation with him, and uh, he went. This, to the this was just a few months before he died, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was. It was terrible. It was terrible. Yeah. I guess All we're right. not. We're we're, are, we're not going to talk about Howdy and uh, uh, what the, the, the thing. What happened after he died? We will after that. But let's let's show this because this is really nice. This is this is a magic moment that everybody is going to love. This is Buffalo Bob Smith selling Howdy Doody merchandise on QVC, 1998. Surprise phone call. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this, Howdy? Ho ho, Buffalo Bob! It's wonderful to be celebrating our 50th anniversary here at QVC. Ho this is great. ho ho! <laughs> that's about all he does. That's, that's well, that, that's and that's just plenty. Oh, Buffalo Bob, he is he is marvelous. Now wait a minute, I got a question. How do is that all you do at all? Oh, I get it. Yeah, it's kind of cute. He does do some things, doesn't he? <laughs> this is great. Well, celebrating. 50 years uh, since the uh, first nationwide broadcast of How Did You Deep, we have some special guests who will be joining us. I knew about some of the surprises coming up. I don't know about this one. So it's a real surprise to both of us. Celebrating 50 years of Howdy Doody, let's welcome a mystery caller to QVC. Mystery caller, you're live with Buffalo Bob Smith. Welcome to the show. Buffalo Bob Smith, do you recognize this voice? Yes. Well, it's Bert Dubrow. Oh my God, Bert Dubrow! Well, I heard my I heard my name mentioned by that lady. Uh, what's her name? Sally Jesse Raphael. I <laughs> produced that show for thirteen years, and I, I got to make something very clear here. Yeah, Bert. Number one, it's important that everybody know what you're looking at on television now with Buffalo Bob is exactly what he is. There are some performers that are a little different on and and off. Bob is exactly what he is, and they're. I certainly would not have had a career as a producer. I would not have a career as a producer if it were not for that uh, that beautiful man there with the white hair. He's uh, he's an incredible, incredible person. And uh, I, I think the videos and everything else that I'm that I'm watching tonight 
it's very important to note that these are not for just how do you do the alumni. These are for uh, kids that are 8, 9, 10, 11, and as Steve was suggesting before, uh, children's television is, is a little questionable today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important that parents buy these for their kids or grandparents buy them for their grandchildren because you just simply won't see more entertaining television. And uh, I was Bob's road manager, by the way, in the 70s uh, when he was doing colleges. I'll shut up, Steve. I just let me just do get it. You're doing great. One point in and let everybody know that we never did one show. This, is, this sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not true. Bob never walked out on the stage. We never did one show without him getting a standing ovation. So he would have to admit, or he better, that I've got, got to be the number one fan. <laughs> Bert, thanks for calling. I love uh, you, Bob. Love you, babe. Now, last year, this was 1997, and now most of you were way over 11. But you're joining us here in the peanut gallery to celebrate our golden anniversary on QVC to celebrate our golden anniversary. Thank you. There he is. That's the very same howdy do. That's photo duty. The same doll that was used. Uh, in what you just and the saw on QVC, eye. and the same—well, it was the other eye, but it, it still you blinks. See how to say that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he can only find the string for the one eye there. But look at that! Look at that! And and you, hold, you, hold you, it. you back, what? back to it. There you go. <laughs> there you. Two seconds of applause. <laughs> Um, that brought a tear to your eye because that was the last time we saw Buffalo Bob on television, right? Yeah, and I haven't seen that s since. I don't think my friend yeah. Elliot um, made me a copy of that some some time ago. But um, I'm so glad somebody recorded that. What I did notice, though, and I didn't notice it until now, that Bob, after I was talking, got a little choked, and I I never saw that before. I never noticed that. Well, before. I if not, if you don't take anything else away from this show, and you should because we've done this is like fabulous what you've brought for us here. Just know that the friend between Buffalo Bob and Bert Dubra. It was father and son, right? I yeah. think he probably loved you as much as he loved his own kids. Yeah, and then it became, as, as he got older, it was like all fathers and sons. Then I became the father and he became the son. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah. Was, yeah. I, 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 um, I hate to end on a sad note, but after Bob passed, there was some legal problem with the actual how did he, did it end up in the Smithsonian? What, what happened? What prompted the lawsuit? What happened here? Let's not spend a lot of time because it's kind of sad. Uh, well, it, it actually, it's it doesn't turn out sad, and it's, okay. it's actually interesting. Good um, for those people that, that care. But there was only one Howdy, Velma's D Velma Dawson's Howdy. He was the one Howdy, and uh, Bob had him. Rufus Rose. Well, very quickly, Rufus Rose was given custody of all those puppets. Not important why, but he was given all the cu the custody. When we went out and started to do the college revival, and Bob was doing television, Rufus kindly sent Howdy to Bob. With a note that said what he wanted to, where how he should go when it was all done, and um, Bob sort of forgot about that and decided that he wanted to sell Howdy, and um, he, and he literally forgot, and he it got into going, and then all of a sudden the Detroit Institute, which is a museum in Detroit, said that they had gotten a letter from Rufus Rose years before that said. They would get Howdy when Bob was finished with him. And Rufus did own Howdy for a, a bunch of reasons that are not important right now. And uh, so lawyers got together. The Detroit Institute got lawyers. The Roses got lawyers because the Roses are gone now. But the son said, how do we know which Howdy that is? We, that's not the original. And here's where I come in. I became this lunatic way before this when I found Velma and looking at that head and which one was it. And so I sort of, I knew. Uh, Velma testified, as I recall. She was like 88 at the time. I'll tell you what happened. Okay. So um, I had done a tribute, a big tribute at NBC to Bob. And we had like like the Hollywood Walk of Fame here where they um, put the, the cement. We did that in New York for Bob. Milton Burrow was first and then Bob's. So we did a big two-week thing at NBC with all my memorabilia and all the puppets and everything. And uh, anyway, I invited Velma in. Well, when they found out that Velma was going to come in, the lawyers, they wanted her to show up and, and identify the puppet. Now, Velma, as you said, is 88. Her eyes were not good at all. And I knew she was going. 
She said she was going. She went, and then she calls me that night and said, Bert, sweetheart, I couldn't. There were four different heads there from the roses. I don't think mine was there. I said, Velma, yours was there. Now listen to me carefully. And I explained to her how she would know. I said, you got to go back. So she went the next day. By the way, the Rose is pretty thrilled about this. or The Rose kids are thrilled at this point because this is what they wanted. They didn't want anyone to identify which one the real one was. I explained to her, as crazy as this sounds, which one was the real one. She went back the next day. She said, excuse me, gentlemen, I was wrong. This is the original Howdy, which it was, by the way. And that Howdy, Bob and Chris Rose lost that case. And the Detroit Institute won. And the, the good news is Howdy went where he was supposed to go. The bad news is that he's not out, so you can't see him. Only every, The same thing happens at the Smithsonian. Right, they only the, put out the stuff that they think is relevant at, at the that time. time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. anyway. But it's it was, there. It's in Detroit. It's in Detroit. Howdy right. is there. And you have not the original photo duty, but, but one the, the, the one, one that he just showed on QVC yeah, is the you one you have there. Yeah. Okay, so that's 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 as far as we can go with this. You've been trying uh, valiantly to keep it alive. Well, we did, did keep it alive on cozy television. Yeah. Um, oh, that's year. right. You did the yeah. whole thing on Labor Day yeah. last, last last year. Labor that's Day. when we connected for the first time. Yeah, and by the way, let me just say this: if anybody would like to see those Howdy shows again or see something, write to NBC Cozy TV and tell me you want to see old Howdy Doody shows. And, and the, the the DVDs that were put out in the last few years are still available. They're kind of expensive now because they're out of print. But if you if you have a hankering to watch the series now and really get into it as a result of what we've done here today you can go on amazon and ebay yes bert just make sure that you get the black and white ones the nbc ones not the florida ones yeah the florida ones are running on cozy aren't they yes yeah and that's all he wants to say about that right. let me get into some emails here and then we have a surprise bonus clip at the end of our show for everybody i have to put the wally cox glasses on because the type here robert q lewis yeah okay hugh christopher henry from mm. brooklyn new york Stu, i am enjoying this show immensely amazing clips and stories please thank mr Du Brow, he is a genius. What is his name? Uh, Hugh from thank Brooklyn. You. I'm, I'm not a, a genius. Wait, wait, wait. Go ahead. I'm not a genius, Hugh, but thank you. That's yes. very nice. I have, I have three things to do now. I have to read, I have to switch <laughs> the camera when you want to talk, and I have to look at my viewers here. Albert Sims in Louisiana, who helped me test the new uh, 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 Daycast streaming system over the weekend, and I thank him for his time on that. We're ready to go with the next show. West Monroe, Louisiana, Bert. As for shows ending, at least Howdy Doody got to announce the ending. I missed a lot of Captain Kangaroo once I started school in the early 70s, but watched him during Halloween holidays in the summer thought he'd go on forever but cbs decided to expand news coverage as far as i know bob keisha never got to announce a final episode i think that's right okay i think that's right what did they replace howdy with on Sh the sherry lewis show they replaced howdy with sherry lewis yeah and what did they replace it during the week with do you remember i don't okay Probably not a kid's show because they weren't no. going to try and fight the Mickey Mouse right, Club. Right. Okay, Mark Bumbera. Bumbera. Hi, guys. Loving the show. See, I told you, well, Bert. You nice. have nothing to worry about here. Besides the final broadcast, are there any known 57 to 60 episodes that are known to survive in their original videotape format, color or otherwise? I'm a fan of early, I'm a fan of early color uh, videotape shows, and years ago I paid through the A dollar sign, dollar sign on eBay to acquire one of the long out of print image entertainment DVDs, which I just spoke yeah. about, just so I could have a copy of the final episode in its original format. After you answer that, uh, how did they find the original show? Uh, well, let me oh, add, the, the original the, of the last broadcast, of the last show. Yeah. Uh, but it, for what he, who was the fellow? Who uh, just, Mark. What Mark just said: the only shows that are available, Mark, are the ones that Stu mentioned before. You can get them on eBay, and uh, you know they're on. They're, 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 th this is the only surviving color videotape. Is the last show? That's right. And now, how did you find it? Uh, let and me Bert do, was the one that found it. Let me do it quickly. Um, I owned on three quarter inch uh, uh, tape. The last 15 minutes of the last show in color. I somehow got it. Let's just say that. And NBC found out that I had it. They called me on the phone and they said to me, you have the last 15 minutes in color? I said, I do. They said, well, we own it. I said, well, no, you don't own it. I own it. You own the rights to it, but I own it. Possession and, is nine-tenths of And the we law. went back and forth. Mm. And I finally said, listen. By the way, they pulled this shit on me with Milton Berle, too. Go Did ahead. You, just, you just use a foul word? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. But fine. it's okay because it's my show. Okay. Go fine. ahead. Um, <laughs> anyway, I said, listen, you guys have the show on in color. You have it on two-inch quad tape, which is what they used to broadcast on or tape on. And said, no, we don't. 
I said, yes, we do. No, we don't. This went back and forth. Mm-hmm. I said, let me tell you what it is. It's in your warehouse in New Jersey. Do you still have your warehouse in New Jersey? They said, yes. I said, go look. You'll see. They called me two weeks later. They said, we, we don't have it. We couldn't find it. I said, I'll tell you what. If you guys will fly me out, I'll be happy to go find it for you. I know where it is. And I knew they wouldn't. I said, look again. They looked again. They called me a week later, and they said, we owe you. I said, why? They said, because not only did we find that two-inch tape, under it, we found a color version of Peter Pan's Mary Martin. Mary Martin doing Peter Pan that we didn't know where it was. So they ended up getting finding that because of Howdy. So that's how dicks, dicks. They just they, nobody cares about their own no, history. You know, don't. it's don't even get me started. No, on I it. won't. Can you imagine? They would never pick up a show like this one because they don't care about but, their but, own history. Well, but they, they yeah, but you, let's not go there. Yeah. <laughs> We got a lot of emails, and I got to save time for a yeah. clip, and, we're, and it's getting late, and it's getting late back east. All right, Chance Mitchell and Jack Roth have comments. Okay, they've been con- they were contributing to our show today. Uh, Stu and Bert, hopefully, Stu, you know by now that planning of this show and our interaction has just been a part of an elaborate ruse to get you to be just like Bert and myself, a howdy devotee. Uh, excuse me, Chance, I was before this. I just never had a chance to do a show because I didn't know Bert, and I needed somebody who knows more about this than me. Believe it or not, I don't know everything. My question to Bert, he has a question question for you Bert is what is your favorite story about being around the terror of NBC Dayton Allen awesome show great memories and clips your favorite Dayton Allen story well I think I told one of them which was the picking of the nose yes and anything else that I could tell I can't tell so it's just too <laughs> you can but you're a gentleman yeah I'm not going to he's but, not like a Jerry Springer guest but but, but chance <laughs> uh, I will call you after the show and we'll discuss stories but let me stop for one minute let's do a bonus video <laughs> Stu, uh, Stu let me stop for one minute yes. and and tell you that Chance Mitchell is near and dear to my heart he uh, contacted me a couple of years ago and he is a young guy who shouldn't know anything about this, is a collector, and I ended up taking a lot of my stuff, turning it over to him for right now, and he is a, a champ of a gentleman. He is one of my dearest friends, and believe it or not, we have not met yet, and I, I bowed a chance for keeping this alive and you and I both should by the way because it's people like Chance I'm not going to bow well, to this yes you will yes you will yes you will because it's people like him that are going to keep this going for you no, and that me. I agree for you with. and me I told and you so- at lunch you know what well, he says to me at lunch he says what are you going to do with all these films when you die because you know I'm 60 years old I'm not going to live forever I thought I was and I said I'm not sure my daughter wants it but there's a handful of listeners and view- now viewers out there that are half our age that appreciate this stuff the way it should be and I may just revise my will I'm not promising so let me just say to end this before we get back to an email yeah thank you to chance mitchell thank you chance and to jack roth for putting helping us put stuff together and loving this the way we do they saved me so much time from even going into my own archives and transferring chance edited all these tapes that we yeah yeah for the most part most of this stuff was done by chance i did some of them yeah but he take no credit give it to chance Chance. (laughs) all right let's hear from jack real quick and we'll go back to the regular viewers Stu, great show by the way the frank paris show is actually april of 48 isn't that what i said and it said so on the clip also the thing that bert couldn't think of when howdy's head split in half was called i am an american day ah okay all all right. Uh, I have footage from that Roger Muir almost trashed it. I, I have footage from that that Roger Muir almost trashed because it had gone vinegar. Yeah, that's a whole other yeah, thing. I have it, Jack. I, I had I, it saved from the trash, having a great time watching. I okay. have it, Jack. Thank and you, the, Jack. And the other thing Jack said real quick was... Gumby, Gumby. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, that's somebody else asked for that. We'll okay. get to that. Oh, um, he's telling me here, he owns two or three prints of the Christmas short, the Howdy short, and he does have a print and sound of the Funland short. He's going to transfer it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank Jack. You. Thank, thank you. you thank Jack. you. Thank you. All right. Let's go through these. We're running out of time. we got a clip, and I want to get done before it's three hours. From Paul Belfay in New Hampshire. I got to meet him in person a few months ago. Great guy. Uh, Stu, great show tonight. How did Bob Smith and company feel about the Howdy Doody parodies that were prevalent during the show's run, such as the Mad Magazine parody and the Ernie Kovacs bit, uh, which was called Howdy Deedee? Here's the answer. Loved it. Uh, Bob loved it. And the person who wrote the Mad Magazine um, parody gave Bob the actual original... um, I don't know what you call it. Storyboard them. thing, right? Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Bob loved it and loved all the parodies. Ernie Kovacs as well. Yeah, very good. Okay, Elliot Goshman, is that your friend, That's Elliot? my friend, Elliot, yeah. Does the clip exist of the Howdy Doody unwrapping unveiled? No, it does not exist. And I can say that with a, 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 with a, a lot of uh, security because we looked and looked and looked. It does not exist. 
Okay. From Roger Scales in Massachusetts, Balerica, Mass. You know where that is, right? Because you do, went to school there. Uh, yeah, but I, I never heard of that. Oh, <laughs> well, he's never heard of you okay, until well, today. Yeah. Uh, why do you think... Why why do you think someone hasn't done a really good HD show photo book complete with broadcast dates, show synopsis, and trivia? I have Stephen Davis's 1987 book, Notes from the Peanut Gallery, which I like, uh, but doesn't have a lot of photos included. Smith's Howdy uh, and me from 1990 also fell short in this area. Well, because um, I think most publishers would have to say that there's not a big enough audience to make a book like that. Uh, it's very limited and that we deal with demographics today and that's just the way it is. Okay, and then besides the howdies that have been released, are there more that exist that could somehow be put out at some point? There are more that exist. I have them. Um, I, I've got a lot. I actually have more than I thought I had until about a week ago. Um, and no, they're not going to be put out. Yeah, because th they want to sell 100,000 units. Yeah, and, and just like here, we've got, what, 1,000 people watching and listening to us combined right now? Yeah. That's not going to cut it for the companies that want to make money, right. especially NBC. Uh, okay, what do we got here from Justin Delbert? Here's your Gumby question. In case it hasn't been mentioned on the show, I was wondering about the genesis of Gumby being on Howdy Duty, since I know that that was where it all started, airing first. Other than that, happy 70th howdy, happy 70th anniversary, howdy duty. Too bad I was not alive then to enjoy it. Justin is a 20-something. He's a millennial, okay, and fine. he wants to know about Gumby. Well, uh, Jack will tell you this, uh, who's sitting there in Yonkers now, <laughs> but Gumby premiered on the Howdy Duty show. A lot of people don't know that, but Gumby did. Uh, uh, look it up in uh, Wikipedia, but there was Gumby on the Howdy Duty show. That's where it started. Ronnie Greenberg, game show producer oh, extraordinaire. Certainly. Ronnie Greenberg, who created the Who, What, and Where game and produced the Joker's Wild. Did he and just say when? Tic Tac Toe. Say when was Goodson Todman. Okay. Fine. Uh, Ronnie Ronnie's, uh, was a Barian and Wright, I, and then on I his own, Ronnie Ron Greenberg. Is. Listen to this. Ready for this? Yes. This is from Ronnie. As a youth and a page at NBC some years ago, one of my assignments was to seat the kids in the peanut gallery. Also, I recall comedian Dayton Allen appearing as Mr. Bluster, Flubba Dub, and other characters. He was hilarious, especially with his gestures under the camera for the crew. Oops, I shouldn't reveal that. And by the way, I was brought up in Buffalo. <laughs> I, I, I think, I, uh, Ronnie, if you're listening, I think that says it all. Anything, <laughs> any more we talk about Dayton, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but how cool! There's there's somebody who was a page. Oh, great. There's still a lot of peanuts out there, you oh, know. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. this is great. Yeah. Final email, and then we got a big surprise for everybody from my buddy uh, Scott Shilby, the minister in Minnesota. You met him when you were here in January. He, he was, sat right there. He sat right over there. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Here we go. You ready? Since I won't be able to listen or watch live, boo hiss, but he's boo, a VIP so it's, uh, a member, so I, oh. I have nothing but admiration for Scott. Uh, two questions. I've read that the Mickey Mouse Club is blamed for the demise of Howdy Duty. We did talk about that. Um, do you agree with the idea, or are there other reasons why Howdy went to Saturday? No, I think the, I think the Mickey Mouse Club, and I think, I think that Monday through Friday time period became not a children's time period. The, the demographic broadened. Yeah. So it was much better to do Saturday morning children. But what was ironic was that when I grew up in the 60s, that time period for the local stations became a haven for cartoons and yes, stuff again. Yeah, yeah. So that it was it was an evolving type yeah. of thing. Okay, and then this final question, and then we'll get to the last surprise here. Uh, Bert, generally speaking, kid shows from the era of Howdy Doody involved human hosts. In my in my in my observation, kids sh kids shows today seem to thrive on animation. Do you, Bert, think today's reliance on animation is helpful or hurtful to children? We should we should explain that that's why the live hosts went away because the stations didn't want to pay. It was cheaper to buy the cartoon packages, and that's why it, they went away, with the exception of Romper Room, which lasted a little longer. But here's that's the question: Do you think it would be better to go back to live hosts today? I don't think so. Today, I think. Um I think the kids are different today. Their their patience is uh, is not what we had. Uh, everything is immediate today. Mm -hmm. Technology is different. Um, and so no, I, I don't think it would work today. I think it was a time that it worked, and it just wouldn't work any longer. All right, and we're we're right on time here to wrap things up. We have one more clip. Can I? At, yes, as you all know, Bert was the executive producer and the creator of the Sally Jesse Raphael show, and he was on that show for 13 years. Got it on its feet, got it working, made it an Emmy-winning talk show. That's what he won his Emmy for. And he tried to get Buffalo Bob on the show as much as he could in an issue-oriented, light entertainment, you know, more issue-oriented talk show. And I'll let him take it from there. This is something nobody has seen in over 30 years. Uh. 
This was uh, the first time Bob did our show. This was in St. Louis. This is uh, in the uh, early uh, mid early to mid eighties, and um, Bob used to do a bit with uh, Clara Bell, Lou Anderson, um, the old shell game. What's underneath each thing, and you, you'll see it. Uh, I don't have to explain it to you, but I had the idea of putting Sally into this, uh, which of course she wouldn't normally be in. It was just Bob and Clarabelle. And if you watch, you will see how I included Sally in this and what a great sport she was. So here we go. 1985, early days of the Sally Jesse Raphael show with Buffalo Bob. Let, let's just so? see now here. We got a seltzer bottle here and a lollipop here and a seltzer bottle. What kind of a dumb game is that? Oh, it's not a dumb game. A thinking game. Okay, what are you going to do? You are going to mix around the boxes, and we have to remember where the lollipop Oh, he's going to mix around the boxes, then we have to remember where the lollipop is. That I sounds good. Can, I can do that. All right. And what if, we, uh, what if we guess the lolly? We get the lolly. If we guess the lolly, we get the lolly. Okay, mix them around. But wait, 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 what wait, happens, wait, wait. What wait. happens if we uh, guess the seltzer? Now, that means that it's most imperative that we all with unerring accuracy recall vividly the container under which the confection lieth therein. You know what that means? Keep your eye on the Keep sucker. All right. Now, here we are. In the middle is the lolly, and we've got a seltzer and a seltzer. Go ahead, mix them up, Sally. Keep your eye on the middle one. Here we go. Okay, go. don't worry. I can do it. Where's the lolly, gang? In the middle? Middle? Middle. What do you say? Middle. What do you say? Middle. 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 You say. What do you say, Sally? It's in the middle. Middle. You say middle. You say middle. You say middle. Who says middle? You say middle. You say middle. He says middle. 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 Everybody says middle. One middle. Hi, little. Little. It's got to be middle. She says middle. She says middle. You say middle. You say middle. You say middle. I say no. I say no. I say there it is right there. In the middle. Oh! Oh! Arabella, don't do that! Oh, Sally, I'm sorry. What? That's a dumb thing to do. <laughs> well, I didn't. Oh. Yeah, I'll wear them. I know. I... Didn't you tell me it was in the middle? He switched them. You switched them. <laughs> That's a dumb game. How are you supposed to get it if you switch them? Now, come on. Play this again. Play that again. Sally, I'm sorry. All right, let's do it again. Now, look, everybody, where is it now? In the middle? Remember, in the middle. Watch it. Watch, watch the middle. One. Now, here we go. Let's play it again. Now, watch, Sally. It's in the middle. Where is it? In the middle? Yeah. Where is it? Middle. You say middle? Where is it? Middle, middle, middle. Hi, little, little. It's got to be in the middle. You say middle, you say middle, you say middle. Another answer, you say middle. You say middle, you say middle, you say middle, middle, middle. There's another middle, 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 middle. I say no. I say no. I say there it is right there in the middle. No! I That's the dumbest game I ever. Oh, Sally, I'm sorry. This is ridiculous, Sarah. You don't play it. That's not a good game. That I got to tell you something, Mr. Dubrow. Not only is she a good sport, because as a talk show host, especially in this type of show, you're supposed to be refined and dignified. To, to allow that, and you can tell that, that's the first thing. To, three things, actually. Second thing, the women, these 40-something housewives in the audience, are yelling, hey, he switched it, just like the kids, the five-year-olds would have done on Howdy Doody. That's the second thing. And I forgot what the third thing was. Oh, I remember what the third thing was. When you pitched this to Bob... Before he came out to St. Louis, he wasn't too receptive. Well, he didn't think she would do it. He said, there's no way. How we shoot. I said, Bob, I'll get her to do it. And in Sally's, uh, you know, it, to, to be fair to Sally, I, I didn't have to talk her into it. She loved it. She loved the she idea. She didn't think it would undignify her, her host duties? She never had that issue. 
That is so refreshing to hear, you know, because I can tell you right now, Bob Barker wouldn't have done that. Phil Donahue probably wouldn't well, have done he wore, that. Well, he wore a dress, so I think maybe... Oh, yeah. maybe he yeah, would have yeah, done yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. Sally, who is just... This is in the early days in St. Louis when she's just trying to establish herself and you're trying to make her into a national star to do that. Yeah. What, forgive me, balls she had. Yeah, yeah, no, it was... <laughs> you know? I, I give her credit. It was, yeah. it was fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was certainly fun. I cannot thank you enough. Um, why don't you do a book? I'm going to. Are you I, really? Yeah. I'm Are you go. really? Yeah, I, I will do one. I was just talking to someone the other day, a writer, about it, um, a writer friend of mine, and people have asked me, meaning friends, and I've never pursued it, but I probably will now. In this day and age of self self publishing and everything, you could get it done. You can have an ebook with a lot of video clips in it and yeah. all kinds of great we'll stuff. See. We got one more email that came in during that clip, oh, and okay, I, it's okay. from Phyllis in Chicago, okay. and she says, "Stu and Bert, I cried a lot at the uh, the closing of the original show clip. I feel so honored to be one of Howdy's fans. I'm watching, sitting here, looking also at a photo of my mom, and when I think of how she and my dad gave me the Howdy Duty puppet, and how I made my mom get." rid of it uh makes me upset i am also laughing a lot these stories are great i did friend bert on facebook and he accepted my friendship and i did write to him and he wrote back to me what a nice man i'll second that um the howdy duty show made so many of us baby boomers once again feel good when it did come back on now Stu, you and bert sure have made this lady happy again i intend on posting this show on many sites once you put it on youtube in a time when we should think of good times and love and peace this is how i feel right now thanks to you both phyllis spaziri in chicago well mentioning that from phyllis and making it clear that lou anderson was clarabelle there that's right that, that was, was lou, a- lou anderson came out i too. don't think you could end this show better than what Phyllis just said. Well, except to say thank you. Thank you and Chance and Jack for all the great clips and yes. for keeping my, Howdy alive. My little, my little group, Chance and, yeah. and Jack. But I thank you for doing this and I thank you for having me and inviting me. And Stu was nice enough to have me at a party for his 500th show. And uh, we have become friends. And as I said to him earlier, we found each other. And this is great. So uh, we'll do more. I'm thrilled. Um, you're going to come back next season. We'll do one of these on Paul Winchell. All done. We'll do it. Yeah, yeah. He's got so much. And Edgar Bergen, I mean, he's an expert on all this stuff. The Paul Winchell stuff is, is quite unique. I've got tape that nobody's there, ever There seen. is a very complicated individual which we can talk about. And you knew him as well as you knew Buffalo Bob. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Great stuff. Okay, that is going to wrap us up. Let me hit the theme song here. If it works, I'm getting tired. Uh, <laughs> doing television is one thing. Doing it for three hours like an audio show is another. We are off next week. We will be back on June 21st with Mark Rothman, comedy writer, producer extraordinaire, former producer of Laverne and Shirley. Bird is applauding for you, Mark, if you're still watching us. I don't even know and, him. And I... Mark is, is we're going to talk about what Mark did in the late 70s, which was Bustin' Loose and the Ted Knight Show and making it. And he did a couple of pilots that didn't sell, one with Rita Moreno, who's hot again because of the one day at a time on Netflix. Yes, Bert? And that jail sentence, you should get into that a little bit with him, too. Right? <laughs> I, Mark, we got to talk about that. And another comedy pilot he did called The Lovebirds with Eugene Levy and Lorna Patterson and a lot of great stars on that, too. In the meantime, have a great couple of weeks. We'll see you live back here on the 21st on Daycast, streaming video. Bye-bye, everybody.